ready when you are. Chair, hold on. Uh, Chair uh, Richards and Rosenthal, am I starting? Um, yes, I'm starting, okay. Uh, good afternoon, I'm Corey Johnson, Speaker of the New York City Council. My pronouns are he, him, and his. I wanna thank Chairs Rosenthal and Richards for holding this really important hearing today. It's a critically important issue. I, I, uh, it's grateful to, I'm grateful to see all of you, but I'm especially grateful to Chair Rosenthal, who has been talking about this issue literally every single day with me, with the council. Uh, she has been a constant siren on this in the best way. So thank you, uh, Helen, for your leadership. This crisis that we are in has impacted the entire world. No one has been spared from the economic and social impacts of this pandemic. And those of us in New York City have felt these consequences even more acutely. We all know someone who has been affected by the coronavirus. Maybe we have a family member who is serving on the front lines of this battle as a first responder, a grocery store worker, a hospital worker. We, name, we may know someone who has been sick or tragically someone who we lost and they were not able to recover. But there are certain individuals for whom this pandemic brings unique challenges that separate from the virus itself can be harmful or even deadly. And this includes those who are survivors of domestic violence. New Yorkers have come together during this unprecedented time as we always have and done what we can to help our neighbors by working on the front lines, maintaining social distance in parks and on streets to the best of our ability, helping our children continue their schooling remotely. And for those of us who can, staying home. But we are, what, what we are recognizing by holding this hearing today is that staying home is not always a safe option. For New Yorkers who are living with an abuser, it can be dangerous. We must do what we can to amplify the voices of those whose dangerous living circumstances have ex are exacerbated by isolation. We must recognize that abuse can take place in many forms. It can be physical, verbal, emotional, financial, or even digital, each, in, each harmful in many ways. And we must ensure that individuals know that help is available. Domestic violence advocates and service providers in New York City are among the heroes of this pandemic. They are working tirelessly to make sure survivors have support, services are still being provided remotely, and domestic violence shelters are open and operating. I want to announce that today the City Council will be launching a social media campaign called hashtag being safe can't wait to spread awareness about the unique challenges and dangers that DV survivors face during this pandemic and to promote available resources. Over the course of the next several days, we will be sharing a toolkit of information for both survivors and bystanders what different types of abuse looks like, signs of possible abuse, why shelters are a safe option, and organizations and services that are open and available across the five boroughs, even during the pandemic. We must ensure that individuals have this knowledge and access the resources now because hashtag being safe can't wait. I wanna thank the NYPD and the mayor's office to end domestic and gender-based gender -based violence, as well as the many advocacy organizations and service providers who are joining us at this hearing today. I also wanna personally thank those brave survivors who are joining us to testify today. We hear you and we are with you. Uh, and with that, I wanna turn it over to Chairs uh, Rosenthal or Richards uh, to begin this hearing. Thank you uh, both so much for your leadership on this, and I look forward to participating in the question and answer period as well. Thank you very much. Or Chair Richard. <laughs>
Committee Council, who's, who's right. going we'll, to Next, we'll move to Chair Rosenthal. Give us one second. It's, these remote hearings are not the easiest. Chair Rosenthal, are you there? I think Chair Rosenthal is muted. If someone could unmute her. Give us one moment. Can one of the sergeants try to unmute Chair Rosenthal? Yes, sir, working on it. It appears we may have lost our connection. All righty, well, thank you, uh, Speaker Johnson and to Chair Rosenthal and good afternoon to everyone. I am Donovan Richards from the 31st District in Queens and I'm the chair of the Committee on Public Safety. Since this is the first virtual hearing I've chaired since the COVID outbreak, I wanna start out by recognizing the first responders, including police, firefighters, EMTs, and all frontline medical workers who are confronting this crisis head on. Many of those folks have put themselves at risk in order to keep us safe. Uh, and many have gotten sick and some have even lost their lives. So I wanna take a moment to recognize the folks on the front lines and to say thank you for your service. If we can do that for at least 30 seconds. Thank you. I also want to wish everyone in, att in attendance good health and hope you are all staying safe with your family and loved ones. For me, it's been a blessing to spend extra time with my wife and son, most of the time anyway, outside of these Zoom calls. But the truth is it's hard for all of us to be confined like this. It's wonderful to see my son growing and learning day by day, but it's hard too, right? To be right on top of one another and to struggle to find an outlet, some time alone to decompress. I've had a stable job and a, and a wonderful, healthy family, and I'm blessed, and it's still hard. So today I'm trying to imagine, and I want all of us to now to just imagine what this confinement means for a victim of intimate partner violence for a child who is witnessing an abusive relationship, for a child who is being abused. Take every moment of stress you feel throughout these days that all seem the same. Every doubt about financial security, about the health and well-being of your parents and your kids, every concern about the future and what kind of world we'll return to when this is all over. And now add the fear of what someone you live with might do to you if all of it becomes too much. Because even before all these things, things weren't good. And now what happens if there is another incident? Do you call the police? Where will they take him? Will he be exposed to COVID at the precinct? at central bookings, at Rikers? Will he come back after and hurt you again, or she? Or get you sick, get the kids sick, get your elderly mom sick? Where else could he or she even go? How are you going to pay rent, buy food, take care of the kids on your own? Can you even imagine it? I'm no expert on domestic violence, and I don't pretend to have the answers for those women and men who are suffering now. My role here is simply to make sure the NYPD is doing all they can under these challenging circumstances. 
But if there are victims and survivors listening, I want you to know that we are here and that many other people are out there looking for ways to help you. Today, we want answers from the administration, but we also want them to have the opportunity to remind everyone that you can help. Services continue to be available. Officers are still on call and they will be there if you need them. Just because we are physically disconnected doesn't mean we have forgotten about you. It doesn't mean that you have nowhere to turn. I'm looking forward to learning from the administration witnesses what they are seeing on the ground and what we need to do as policymakers to ensure that victims and survivors of domestic violence are able to seek help and get what they need to stay safe. Specifically, I want to know just what is going on with text to 911. We had a hearing on this in November. It should have been rolled out years ago. And now we're in the middle of a crisis where it sure looks like victims might not be comfortable picking up the phone to report a crime. So I want to know when we're getting that done and what we're going to do until then to make up for the fact that a technology as simple as text messages can't be used to get emergency help. So I'm expecting some answers on that. With that, I will turn over to the speaker or to Chair Rosenthal, and I look forward to hearing from the administration. Thank you all. Thank you, uh, Chair Richards. Do we have uh, Chair Rosenthal back? I think she's having some Wait. technical difficulties. I can, um, oh, oh, Chair Rosenthal. So I'm back and I wanna thank you for your patience and thank you, Speaker. I just wanna check on some technical things because my computer shows uh, the moment to crash is just when we started. So um, has anyone gaveled us in? Yes, Chair Rosenthal, uh, I gave an opening statement. I called on you, but you were dealing with the issues. So then Donovan went. And so now it's time for your opening statement and then we'll hear from the administration. Thank you so much, Speaker. Um, I do wanna first start by thanking the ASL interpreter. I see her hard at work on the Zoom screen. Um, so I'm Helen Rosenthal, Chair of the Committee on Women and Gender Equity. My pronouns are she and her, and I really wanna thank the Speaker and Chair Richards of the Committee on Public Safety for joining us for this critical hearing on this special day. Uh, today is May Day, which honors the struggle of working people around the world. The COVID-19 crisis has had a devastating and incredibly far-reaching impact on our city. One of the most sinister aspects of the crisis is how to put the most vulnerable people in our society, they are now especially applies to survivors of domestic violence, many of whom are now trapped with their abusers 24 seven. Access to the normal physical outlets for help or even just temporary respite while a partner goes to work has vanished almost overnight. The lockdown has intensified the abuse of power and control, which is at the heart of DV. The dire situation is only compounded by the overall stress and financial instability that the pandemic has caused. And I want to add here that while we focus on domestic violence today, this is not separate and apart from child abuse, elder abuse, and other forms of violence that have also been exacerbated by the COVID-19 crisis. Globally, domestic violence has surged since the COVID-19 outbreak began. I think Countries we lost Chair Rosenthal for a moment. Oh, you're kidding me. Uh, Helen, are you back? there? I am. I can, can you see not hear you, me? but we can't hear you. Oh my goodness. I Hold can on, I'm going to try to mute you, you and unmute you. Hold on. Try speaking now. Okay. Can you hear me now? No. Oh, 
That's weird. And this is such a great opening statement from you. Thank you. Why I do. You, uh, Helen, why don't you quickly log out and log back in and hopefully Thank that you, works speaker. and we'll just pause this meeting for a second because I really want to hear your opening statement. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker Johnson. Well, Thank you everyone for being patient with us. Uh, we really appreciate it. I'm unmuted. Okay. Can y'all hear me now? Can people hear Helen? I can't hear her, but can other people hear her? Okay. Then it's my, right. it's my issue, not yours. Go ahead, Helen. Okay. Keep going. I'm going to log out and log back in. Okay. Thank you so much, Speaker. I really appreciate you. Um, so let's see. Um, globally, this is where we were, I think. Domestic violence has surged since the COVID-19 outbreak began with cities and countries reporting a 30% spike in domestic violence. What we know so far in New York City is extremely troubling. In New York City, we know that calls to all the DV hotlines were initially down, way down in March, but we're starting to see a slight increase in April. And I think what this tells us is not that abuse is not happening, but that victims and survivors are not able to call for help in the ways that they have before. This is all the more chilling because we know that domestic violence during a crisis is more severe and more likely to result in death. The World Health Organization has identified that intimate partner violence, child abuse and sexual violence are highly prevalent after, during and after a disaster. And advocates stress that the real surge in numbers and demand for Once pause restrictions lift, many survivors who cannot leave now are making their plans for when the lockdown is lifted. The stakes couldn't be higher. Time is ticking away. We have to show up for our survivors. Based on conversations with providers so far, we believe that a continuous, robust messaging campaign is critical to ensure that every New Yorker is aware of available resources and the fact that DV victims and survivors can get help now. We should plaster the DV hotline phone numbers on buses, grocery stores, bus shelters, pharmacies, on the link stations. It should be well known that even in times of pandemic, resources are available to all communities. Whether you are a person who is undocumented, a trans woman of color, or a senior citizen, you can get help now. Many community-based providers are already finding innovative ways to connect with survivors. The Hellenic American Neighborhood Action Committee devised a radio station and podcast. The Arab American Family Support Center created a confidential telecounseling platform. And Womenkind and other providers have initiated online chat services. As the city continues to develop its responses to the pandemic in our communities, we need to look no further than these culturally competent organizations to provide the robust and meaningful messaging that survivors need. The central goals of today's hearing are to learn as much as possible about the current landscape of domestic violence in New York City, to understand where they are now, especially the most vulnerable survivors, the undocumented, non-native English speakers, transgender, and LGBTQ plus New Yorkers. We have to highlight services that are available now for services for survivors and strategize how to increase public awareness and access. This includes messaging, alerting survivors about service changes, 
and reinforcing that they can always reach out for help. We have to ring the alarm about what needs to be done now to prepare for the surge in DV cases that is anticipated when pause restrictions are lifted. And we have to understand how the city, the city council, and each of us as community members can best respond to and support New Yorkers in danger. We are grateful to the mayor's office to end domestic and gender-based violence and the NYPD and HPD, uh, HRA for joining us today. And we thank many advocacy organizations and service providers who will be testifying. You've been working so hard over the past six weeks. We know you are beyond busy, so we really want to thank you for taking the time to participate. I would also like to thank my chief of staff, Marisa Mock, my legislative director, Madhuri Shukla, my communications director, Sarah Crean, as well as the committee staff for their work in preparing for this hearing. Brenda McKinney, the general counsel, Chloe Rivera, senior legislative policy analyst, Monica Peppel, financial analyst, Elizabeth Arts the commun from community engagement. And finally, um, let's see, I'm just gonna note or have you already done this? Who, which other uh, council members are present here? We have not done that, so happy to have you do it. Okay, uh, I see on my screen, uh, council member Powers, of course, Chair Richards, council member Lansman, council member Cohen, um, council member Vallone, um, Apologies for this taking a minute. Council Member Menchaka, I saw Council Member Lander, Council Member Ayala, Council Member Adams, um, Council Member Cabrera, thank you all for joining. I don't see anyone else. If there is someone else, Council Member Brandon um, is here. I believe if Council Member other... Council Member Yeager is here as well. Oh, yes, Councilmember Yeager. Thank you so much. Um, now I'm going to turn it over to our procedural items. Thank you again. Thank you, Chair Rosenthal. I'm Brenda McKinney, Counsel to the Committee on Women and Gender Equity at the New York City Council. Before we move forward, I want to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you are called on to testify when you will be unmuted by the host. I will be calling on panelists to testify. Please listen for your name to be called. I will be periodically announcing who the next panelist will be. We will begin with testimony from the administration today. The first panelist will be C Commissioner Cecile Noel and Deputy Commissioner and General Counsel Elizabeth Dank from the Mayor's Office of Gender and uh, sorry of um, Domestic and Gender Based Violence, followed by Deputy Chief Kathleen White and Assistant Deputy Commissioner of Legal Affairs Oleg Chernovsky from the NYPD. I will call on you when it is your turn to speak. During the hearing, if council members would like to ask a question, please use the Zoom raise hand function, and I will call on you in the order that you raise your hands. We will, we will be limiting council member questions to five minutes, including answers. We will be putting a three minute clock on all other witnesses. Please also note that for the ease of this virtual hearing, we will not be allowing, or we will be using a second round of questioning. Thank you. Chair, if there are are no other questions, I will move to calling on members of the administration to testify and the oath. Yes, please do that. I will now call on members of the administration to testify. Testimony will begin with representatives from the mayor's office to end domestic and gender-based violence, followed by representatives from the New York City Police Department or NYPD. We will begin uh, with council member questions after all administration testimony. Members of the administration, I will read the names of all witnesses first, then ask you to raise your right hand, read the oath, and read your names individually for you to respond to the oath. We, today we will be hearing testimony from Commissioner Cecile Noel from the Mayor's Office to End Domestic and Gender-Based Violence, or NGBV, 
Deputy Commissioner and General Counsel Elizabeth Dank, also from NGBV. Deputy Chief Kathleen White from NYPD, Assistant Deputy Commissioner for Legal Affairs, Oleg Chernovsky from NYPD, and Deputy Commissioner for Intergovernmental and Legislative Affairs, Aaron Drinkwater from DSS. If you can please raise your right hand for the camera, I will deliver the oath and then name you individually. Do you, do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly? Council member questions. Commissioner Noel. Yes, I do. Deputy Commissioner Elizabeth Dank. Can I? Deputy <laughs> Chief White from the NYPD, Kathleen White. I, I did. Okay, thank you. Assistant Deputy Commissioner for Legal Affairs, Oleg Chernovsky from the NYPD. Yes, I do. And Deputy Commissioner Aaron Drinkwater from DSS. I do. I do. Thank you. We're ready. We'll begin with the testimony. Um, can't hear you. Can't, we can't hear you. When you are ready, we will begin with testimony. Uh, and Commissioner Noel, if you can begin. Okay. Good, a Good afternoon, Chair Richards, uh, Chair Rosenthal, and members of the committees, committees on Women and Gender Equity and Public Safety. I am Cecile Noel, Commissioner of the Mayor's Office to End Domestic and Gender-Based Violence. My pronouns are she, her, hers. I am joined by Deputy Commissioner General Counsel Elizabeth Dank. I am pleased to also be here with Deputy Chief Kathleen White, Commanding Officer of NYPD's Domestic Violence Unit. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you about the impact of coronavirus or COVID-19 on domestic violence in New York City. COVID-19 puts into sharp focus the vulnerabilities that many people in our city face every day, especially domestic and gender-based violence survivors and highlights the barriers and challenges that we know keep people from seeking help and finding safety. Domestic violence is, is historically underreported, and this is heightened by the, pan, by the pandemic, resulted in what we anticipated, a decrease in survivor engagement with service providers and with law enforcement since mid-March. While the stay-at-home order our city is under is critical to respond to COVID-19, we understand that home is not always a safe place. Survivors need us now more than ever in these extraordinary times. And our top priority remains to ensure the continuity of services, access to resources, and unwavering support during this unprecedented challenge facing New York City and the world. NGBV has taken a variety of steps to provide services to survivors, engage with providers, collaborate across city agency, and publicly share information about resources. The New York City Family Justice Centers, or FJCs, which are operated by NGBV, temporary, temporarily closed their walk-in locations on March 18th, 2020, in response to COVID-19. The FJCs immediately transitioned to a remote model answering phone lines Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. The phone lines are answered by NGBV staff and our frontline city contracted staff from Safe Horizon. And they are able to directly link clients across all five boroughs with critical crisis support and advocacy by connecting survivors to the FJC and community-based providers for immediate safety planning, shelter assistance, mental health services, children's counseling, legal consultations, and more. Since the FJCs began operating remotely on March 18th, we've served an average of 74 clients a day, including an average of 23 new clients a day. We are encouraged to see that new clients are able to identify resources and reach out safely for assistance. 
FJCs are working closely with us to ensure that all FJC, FJC partners are working closely with us to ensure that all FJC services are provided remotely. While it is more challenging to provide services remotely to survivors who may be isolated at home with their abusive partners, our FJCs and community-based service providers continue to do this through using creative engagement approaches that are developed with the survivor and grounded in survivor safety and minimizing risk. When initially reaching out to survivors, our FJCs and providers first assess their ability to have safe conversation at that time and suggest ways to make that happen. <clears throat> For example, during this pandemic, providers are continuing to work with their clients to develop a code word or phrase that a survivor can use to let the provider know if it has become unsafe to continue the conversation. This is safety planning best practice and that, that we have always shared in our trainings for FJC and community partner organization. But it has become even, even more, but it has become an even more important tool to utilize during this health pandemic. Law enforcement can also use this strategy when reaching out to survivors remotely and best practices like these are, are pivotal in that effort. We have also adapted our service delivery model in light of COVID. For example, we are connecting survivors directly to our legal service partners so that they can support survivors in drafting initial family offense petition, requesting orders of protection in the virtual family court parts. Through each FJC, NGBV staff convenes FJC partners on a weekly basis to discuss virtual operations, share best practices for safety, planning and risk assessment, and provide virtual training on, trainings on a variety of topics. Trainings include how to help survivors file a fam family court orders uh, for, for uh, protection remotely, updates on criminal court operations during COVID, and training on how to support survivors with safety planning. We have also recognized that emergency funds are critical to survivors during this pandemic and are thrilled to receive a grant from the Rihanna Clara Lionel Foundation in collaboration with Twitter and Square CEO Jack Dorsey and Jay-Z Sean and, and the Jay-Z Sean Carter Foundation, which was secured by the Mayor's Fund, uh, the, the, the Mayor's Fund to Advance New York to support unconditional micro grants for domestic and gender-based violence survivors to ensure their safety and stability during COVID. In addition to ensuring continued uh, continuity of FJC services, N N NGBV has been working to creatively connect with survivors via mobile devices and online resources. On April 6th, New York City Emergency Management released the first domestic violence related text through COVID text 19, 692, 692, 692 text system. As a direct impact of the text message, we identified an immediate increase in visits to our NYC HOPE website and calls to the New York City Domestic Violence Hotline. On average, <clears throat> 3,200 visits to NYC HOPE were received within 60 minutes of each of the four alerts that have gone out so far. These texts are scheduled to be released regularly right now, and we have seen a continue and we have seen continued direct impacts to both NYC Hope and the hotline. NGBV has also partnered with First Lady Charlene McRae to release a public service announcement on April 15th to let survivors know that help is available and connect them to resources. Prior to the release of the PSAs, all city agencies were given our social media toolkit and were asked to help am amplify our social media campaign. In addition to social, in addition to the social media toolkit, has has been sent out to council members as well. And 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 we will reshare the toolkit again immediately following the hearing. We are also regularly posting and report reposting resource information on our Twitter and Twitter. Facebook and Instagram pages and have advertisements running on Facebook Google, and Google search. Since the social media campaign launched on April 1st, individuals accessing 
NYC Hope from Google and Facebook have quadrupled from 350 prior to the campaign to 1300 now since the campaign launched. Further, we have partnered with Shared Valued Media to work with 17 community-based partners to amplify NGBV's We Understand campaign on their own social media platforms with targeted messages. Finally, we will be enhancing our campaign investment to put advertisements for NYC Hope in convenience stores, check cashing locations, and laundromats. We are also exploring similar messages for pharmacies and grocery stores. We know that with New York, we know that with New York State on pause, survivors, particularly those who are living in a living with their abusive partners have very limited opportunities to leave their home and connect with services. There are limited access points for information for survivors right now, and we are exploring all pathways for, in, for information that exist across our sister agency programs and initiatives. For example, we are partnering with the New York City Department of Education and uh, the Department of Housing Preservation um, HPD and the New York City Housing Authority and the Department of Small Businesses, just to name a few, in identifying ways to connect with survivors during the pandemic. We are also working collaboratively with the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice and the District Attorney's Offices to directly support their outreach to survivors and connection to services. We have also been regularly connecting externally with providers through multiple channels to provide open lines of communication, identify challenges, troubleshoot issues, share best practices, and provide support, training, and technical assistance. Providers and stakeholders engagement has been included, for, for example, bi-weekly calls with 100 plus providers led by myself, borough-based meeting with council uh, funded Dove providers, hosting or partnering in stakeholder meetings and broad outreach to stakeholders. We anticipate seeing both short-term and longer-term impacts of COVID on survivors and we'll be continuing to process and analyze this in the coming months. We know that switching to remote operation ha operations has inspired NGBV and our partners to think creatively and innovatively about how to reach survivors and deliver services in this new way. We already know that there are some great lessons learned from this experience that will enhance the ways in which we provide services. As we think about, re as we think about what reopening may look like, integration of new methods of service delivery will be an essential piece of that discussion. The city is here for survivors during this crisis and beyond, and we will continue to work to identify best practices and innovative approaches to enhance the services and outreach. We look forward to continuing to collaborate with the council, our sister agencies, and community partners. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to these issues. I welcome any questions you may have. Deputy Chief White. All and members of the council. I have Deputy Chief Kathleen White, the commanding officer of the New York City Police Department's Domestic Violence Unit. I am joined here today by Assistant Commissioner for the uh, Oleg Chernovsky and the Commissioner for the Mayor's Office to End Domestic and Gender Based Violence, Cecil Noel. On behalf of Police Commissioner Dermot Shea, I wish to thank the Council for the opportunity to speak about the Department's efforts to combat domestic violence. During this time of uncertainty, the NYPD's efforts to protect residents and businesses have never been more crucial than it has been over the past two months. It has been an unprecedented time in our nation's and history of our city, a time when residents are depending on their first responders more than ever. While the department has experienced significant challenges with nearly 20% of the uniformed workforce out sick at the height of the pandemic, over 4,000 members of the service having tested positive for the virus and tragically 37 members having succumbed thus far. The men and women of the department remain committed to fulfilling our mission by first and foremost, protecting those who are most vulnerable, those who cannot help or control their circumstances. 
Among the most vulnerable victims are victims of domestic violence, a crime that we all know to be historically underreported. Unfortunately, domestic violence continues to afflict our communities as the NYPD responds to and assists with over 240,000 911 calls for domestic violence annually. Combating domestic violence has been and remains one of the department's top priorities. But our collective efforts to combat domestic violence are all the more important during these times of physical isolation when victims may be left alone with their abusers. Stressors such as the loss of employment, financial hardship, and social isolation can exacerbate an already abusive relationship. Yet from March 29th through April 26th, all of which was spent in lockdown, reported domestic violence index crimes have been down 36.5%, 618 versus 973. Further, during this 28-day period, domestic violence arrests were down 43.6%, 3,822 versus 2,157, even though radio runs were up 1.6%. 17,987 versus 17,699. I want to assure you that we are not lulled into complacency with these lower domestic crime numbers. We are responding to every call for service. If we are able to develop that probable cause of a crime exists, we are making arrests. When we respond to a call for service and cannot develop probable probable cause of a crime, we always take a domestic incident report to document the complaint and our response. All domestic incident reports are triaged and appropriate follow-up conducted on each founded domestic incident report by both the domestic violence prevention officers and the crime victim assistance program victim advocates of each respective precinct and police service area. My staff and I continue to closely monitor reported incidents of domestic violence in every precinct borough and citywide to ensure that no victim slips through the cracks and to identify patterns early on so that resources can be dispatched and social services can be recommended. In spite of the effects of COVID-19, we are endeavoring to continue unabated as best as we can. We still monitor the high propensity and child at risk programs. These programs allow our domestic violence prevention officers to focus on the most at risk homes homes where domestic violence occurred in front of the children, where there have been multiple complaints, or where there are elderly individuals involved. I continue to attend weekly meetings with members of the clergy and domestic violence advocacy groups virtually so that I can have the best possible understanding of what they are seeing and hearing as well. Oftentimes, people who are unwilling to speak with the police will confine in these community advocates or leaders. We have been reviewing hundreds of body-worn camera videos of radio runs related to domestic violence. We wanted to make sure that officers were handling these situations properly. We have been able to confirm that in all these situations, officers responded to radio runs and services were provided as needed. We have continued our outreach as well. Every day I tweet about how individuals can get help. We have been sending out our domestic violence car around to neighborhoods with high number of complaints to get the word out that help is available. I worked with Live on New York to discuss the support that is available to domestic violence survivors. I am pleased that I was invited here today because any opportunity that we have to potentially reach survivors of domestic violence is one that I value. I encourage all the council members as community leaders to use their networks to continue to spread the word that help is available. The NYPD has dedicated many resources to fighting domestic violence and our officers are committed to helping anyone who feels disconnected or vulnerable during this pandemic. Each lo local precinct and police service area has at least one domestic violence prevention officer. Our 525 NYPD domestic violence prevention officers, investigators and supervisors assist victims of domestic violence in precincts and housing bureau police service areas citywide. Under normal circumstances, domestic violence prevention officers visit the homes of victims, make referrals to court, offer counseling services and shelter alternatives and help in personal safety planning. We are continuing to work with victims to create safety tips, including one, keeping a cell phone with you at all times, developing a code word to share with children, family, friends, coworkers, when you want them to call the police staying in touch with family, friends, coworkers by engaging in face-to-face -face contact via FaceTime, Skype, phone, or other social media 
to help stay con connected and telling family and friends if they don't hear from you by a certain time to call 911. Identifying safe rooms in an apartment or house and avoiding dangerous situations. Telling children to go to a separate room for their safety and call 911. Making weapons less accessible. For example, putting knives on a top shelf to buy more time to leave a, a residence if necessary. Planning an escape route. Where would you go? Who would you call? Having a go bag in your home or at a friend's house containing clothing, money, important documents, and medication for you and your children. Domestic violence prevention officers typically make nearly 200,000 home visits a year. However, in light of the COVID-19 outbreak, the domestic violence prevention officers have had to adjust their practices and have been reaching out to victims of domestic violence by telephone. These dedicated professionals and the department as a whole are doing everything in our power to assist victims of these terrible crimes and are providing these same essential services during these trying times. A crime victim assistance program a cornerstone of the NYPD's efforts to improve its response to victims of crime, staffed by Safe Horizon personnel, places two victim advocates in each of the NYPD precincts, one specializing in working with victims of domestic violence, the other serving victims of all other crimes. Victim advocates have done Yemen's work in addressing the trauma that reverberates for victims of crime, particularly domestic violence crime. Our victim advocates have also been required to alter their practices by working from home to offer and deliver services to victims during these trying times. Victim advocates can connect with victims with the same array of high quality programs and services as were available prior to the outbreak. These dedicated workers have not wavered in their commitment to providing the highest quality of service. The NYPD's domestic violence unit stands ready and committed to provide valuable services to those falling victim to domestic abuse. Officers are working vigorously to follow up on reports, make arrests where appropriate, and check in on the New Yorkers, including the most vulnerable population, children and elderly, am amid this ongoing COVID-19 crisis to ensure that everyone is safe. I cannot stress enough that those who are in need of assistance should reach out to the NYPD. The NYPD is continuing to respond to cases of domestic violence and remains committed to serving and assisting survivors during this challenging time. There is no need to suffer in silence. Help is available. In case of an emergency, victims should call 911. Victims seeking help can call 1-800-621-HOPE 24 hours a day, seven days a week to get help. I thank you for this opportunity to speak about this important issue, and I look forward to answering any questions that you may have. Thank you to Commissioners Noel and Deputy Chief White. Uh, we will now move to council member questions for the administration. During this time, all members of the administration, we will unmute you all. Um, we will start with questions from the speaker followed by Chair Rosenthal and then Chair Richards. If council members would like to ask questions um, or testify, order that you raise your hands. Thank you, Speaker Johnson. Thank you, uh, Brenda. I want to go to the NYPD first, and I want to thank you, Deputy Chief, for your uh, testimony uh, and for the work that you're doing. And I want to give my real thoughts to the police department who have lost a tremendous number of officers and other personnel. So we are thinking of you, and thank you for being here today. Um, you know, you talked about it, and uh, Chair Rosenthal and Chair Richards spoke about it as well, but I, I'm concerned about the statistics from March. Radio runs were up 10%, but DV crime complaints were down 15%. And I wanted to see if that trend has continued in April. Okay, so we'll look at, we'll look at April, um, and I'll go with you on a week-by-week -week basis in April, if that works for you. Yes, thank you. Okay, so the week ending April 5th, um, domestic incident reports were down 8%. They were down 422, and this is citywide. And the DV radio runs were up 5.5%, uh, up 238. The next week that ended up April, ending on April 12th, um, domestic incident reports were down 14.3%, down 757. And then domestic violence radio runs were down 3.4%, down 154. Then the week ending April 19th, domestic incident reports were down 22.6%, down 1,229. 
DV radio runs were down 5.9 percent, down 266. And then the last week um, that we're looking at, the numbers aren't fully in yet, but um, DV radio runs are down 8 percent, down 361. And as of 9:45 this morning, the domestic incident reports were down 18.8 percent, uh, down 1,016. And that number will will increase a little bit more as we have some data uh, inputting uh, issues as, as so many of our, our officers are out, out sick and we have uh, the clerical civilians working from home. So they're constantly being updated every couple of hours to catch up, um, so. Thank you, Deputy Chief. So how do you interpret those numbers when you look at that as someone well, who is, okay. yeah, I would love to hear your thoughts on how you interpret the March numbers and the April numbers and what concerns you see from those numbers. Well, um, I like I like to, to to think that that's going to be the million dollar question that we're going to be looking at and really analyzing um, between now and and probably a little bit more time throughout the next couple of months. Um, of course, when when the the pandemic first started in in March, um, you know everyone was at home, and um, now as we see we're moving on further. Uh, individuals are starting to, to to leave the residences a little bit. They're 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 going out, going to the grocery stores, and and they're out and about uh, social distancing, and you know going to the parks and that. So there's a little bit more um, a separation, if you will. They're not home bottled up together all the time per se. Uh, and there are a lot a lot of other avenues out there that that they can go. I mean, we are always concerned about domestic violence being underreported, and that's nothing new. Um, that we've, we've been concerned about that from day one before the pandemic, because the victims only want to report it when they're ready to report it, or when they feel that the time is appropriate for them to report it. Um, you know, we, we try and reach out to all the victims. Um, we've gone so far as to reach out to victims of uh, felony assaults, uh, both uh, and misdemeanor assaults from the week before. Every week we reach out to the victims the week before that have reported to make sure that they have gotten follow up home visit phone calls and that they have been afforded, um, you know, different planning, um, the, the uh, safety tips and, and let them know that the FJCs are virtually open for them and we still have our offices from the FJCs working as well. And we are also reaching out to our high propensity violence victims, our children at risk households and our elderly households. Um, we've had these lists established, you know, um, for quite a long time now, and we usually check in with those victims twice a month, you know, two to three times a month anyway, so we're continuing to check up on them as well, you know. Yeah, Deputy, um, Deputy Chief, I have a question. So why are arrests down more than 43 uh, percent than criminal complaints, which are down 25 percent overall and 36 percent for felonies? Whenever there is a criminal complaint for domestic violence, there should be an arrest unless the person flees. But you would think they would go down by the same amount if officers are making all arrests when the victim alleges a crime. So how do you, how did those numbers sort of add up? Um, well, you know, normally when we take the domestic incident report uh, for the violation of the order of protection, um, we, our DBOs are going to follow that up with a in-person home visit. And sometimes when we knock on that door to do the home visit, the offender is there and we can arrest him right then and there. The follow-up home visits are being done by phone. So that window of opportunity has now closed for us since we're doing the visit by phone as opposed to in person. Um, the other reason might be, you know, the victims, uh, they might not... Um, wish to tell us um, that they're there. They might not want them arrested right now because, um, you know, they're going to possibly go to central booking, go to jail, pick up COVID, bring it back home. You know, there's a lot of factors that are coming into play. Um, we can, we can stress that, um, uh, you know, they should always try and make sure that they are safe. Um, and we know that they're going to tell us if, if, if they really need help, they are going to call us. They might reach out to advocacy groups. They might reach out to the clergy. They might reach out to other family members. Um, it's not that we don't wish to make the arrests. Uh, we, we, 
we always try and make the arrests. You know, our manpower has been has been really, really strained because of this whole pandemic. Uh, at the height a couple of weeks ago, my my domestic violence officers, I had 72 DVOs out sick. That was 18% of my staffing. And now this week, I'm, I'm happy to say that this week we just got slightly under 7%. I only have 30 officers out sick. So our, our manning is coming back, but as well as our manning is coming back, patrol is still losing officers out sick from the pandemic. And we sometimes backfill patrol. Uh, the housing uh, domestic violence units are down to one sergeant and, and two, two officers assigned to each, each uh, PSA. And um, we are trying to ensure that we have one or two in our units as well. So uh, by all means, if we uh, are given the opportunity to make an arrest, we will definitely make that arrest. We are very good at that. Um, we want to make sure that these victims are kept safe. Uh, so th 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 thank you. Thank you, Deputy Chief. I mean, I, I, I totally understand what you're saying as it relates to how your workforce has been impacted by this and how it's impacted your ability to potentially do the job that you would normally do outside of a pandemic if you were fully staffed up. You know, I, I am concerned as I'm sure you are as well, and it's why we're having this hearing. It goes to the heart of your testimony, of Commissioner Noel's testimony, and I'm sure you're gonna hear it from Chairs Richards and, and Rosenthal. I'm just really concerned that given the unprecedented and unique circumstances that we find ourselves in right now, that there are countless, countless uh, victims who are just trapped at home with abusers, with people that are threatening them, abusing them, harming them in a significant way. And we know that these folks were vulnerable before, uh, coronavirus hit, but now they're even more vulnerable. And, and what, I'm, what I'm just hoping is that with a coordinated response from the NYPD, from the amazing organizations that are being represented here today that do this work with survivors and with victims, from the, the, the Commissioner Noel and her team, that we are going to be innovative. We are going to be creative. We are going to figure out ways to get to these victims, to these survivors, because it's heartbreaking to think that in this incredibly painful moment for our city, that there are people that are literally trapped behind doors, children and, 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 and adults who are just being constantly abused and taken advantage of and harmed in serious ways. And I understand, of course, that protocol has changed in this moment because of COVID-19, but it is a little alarming to me that the officers aren't going to the apartments. I would think that, you know, I was talking to the Administration for Children's Services and they're still sending out child welfare specialists to do home visits. They have a protocol on how to do it. They have PPE, they may not walk inside the apartment. They have all, they have all sorts of things they do to check, but to think that, that some of these follow-ups are happening by phone, that sort of concerns me even more uh, to, un to, to know about the situation these victims are in. So I just want to acknowledge that I totally understand this really difficult task that you all have right now, but I, I, I just feel so alarmed um, for you know thousands, if not tens of thousands of people that are currently being abused today, May 1st, in New York City. And are we doing everything we can to help these individuals? I mean, I know that's, that's what you want to happen. I, I, that, that's our big concern. Well, you know, we were even trying to think outside the box and looking at the 311 calls for loud noise or arguing in that, that maybe neighbors might be placing. And we, we took a look at our busier precincts, the three, four up in, in Washington Heights, and then the seven, three and the seven, five in Brooklyn North area. And um, there were thousands of calls for, for loud noises and, and, and et cetera. And we drilled way, way down to see if any of those calls could have been domestic related. And in all three places, it was maybe two or three calls. And at that point, when we really looked at it, it was for a, a verbal argument. It was, um, it was uh, a violation, it was minimal. So, uh, and we looked at over 3,500 calls in each of those precincts. So- um, 
But I, but I guess, Deputy Chief, the concern is that officers are not making arrests in all cases that they should. And how do we make sure that they're making arrests in all cases that they should? They should make an arrest for every complaint related to domestic violence. Officers must make an arrest on all felony complaints. And what we do here is we review the body camera footage from the patrol officers when they respond to the jobs to make sure that they are effecting arrests when they need to. Not every domestic um, incident mandates an arrest. That's that's kind of a, um, a misnomer that you're you're uh, that, that's being referred to. You know, there is discretion on some of them. And if a complainant does not want an arrest on some of them, sometimes we do not have to make that arrest. So, um, you know, on must arrest situations, we must arrest. Um, but to prevent that, to, to prevent any that are slipping through the cracks, we are doing self inspections on all body worn camera footages from jobs that, you know, uh, domestic related. So thank you. I have a lot more questions, but I'm not gonna keep going because there are a lot of members on the call. The chairs have questions. So I have a bunch of questions for Commissioner Noel. So I will come back uh, for a second round later after we get through a bunch of the other members. I have to go on a, another Zoom conference in a little, little while. So I hope I'm around to ask the questions to Commissioner Noel, uh, but I will turn it now over uh, to I believe Chair Rosenthal uh, because she has been an incredible leader during all this on these issues. And I wanna make sure she has plenty of time to ask questions. And then she and Chair Richard Richards will make sure we get through to the members as quickly as we can as well. So thank you, Deputy Chief. I'll come back to you, Commissioner Noel, if I'm still around and I turn it over to Chair Rosenthal. You know, thank you, Speaker Johnson. You've been the one leader in the city who's really picked up on the on this issue. I appreciate your agreeing to have a hearing on this. That's a real um, sign of leadership on your part. And um, it's incredibly meaningful that we're doing this today. I, I'm going to just ask one question each of the um, NYPD and NGBV and then turn it over to Councilmember Richards. Um, but I would like to start with the NYPD um, Deputy Chief, if we could just keep going on the, the speaker's line of questioning, what he's pointing out uh, that is that if we set aside the radio runs, so just we're not going to think about radio runs, if the complaint is taken, right, then an arrest is made if the abuser is on site right? If he's not on site, then you're going to put out a warrant for the arrest and et cetera. My if concern about a violation of order of protection, if, if he is violent, if an order has been violated, we would make an arrest. Depending no, I'm on talking about a felony complaint or a felony. domestic misdemeanor, right. domestic violence misdemeanor. A felony complaint is a must arrest. Yeah, and there's no rape. There is no discretion in that. We are making the arrests. That's right. And the concern is, is that in the categories where um, there are two concerns. One is the number of complaints themselves uh, are down in a statistically significant way. And then the number of arrests are down in a st statistically significant amount. Look, COVID has brought on, we're learning, everyone is learning every day about this. And I'm not saying that your, your officers, you know, I am saying your officers are juggling so much. And my heart goes out to uh, our lost officers. That's tragic. And it's got to be, you know, they're doing even more of a public service now as they go to someone's door. But I know there's language that they could be using to try to coax out an abuser. We could know that, um, you know, they, there's language on how they could be talking to someone behind the door uh, to respond to um, a situation where the abuser might be saying, look, everyone has COVID here, go away, there's no abuse it's wouldn't you agree that it's concerning 
the drop in the number of complaints and the drop in the number of arrests. And I appreciate your saying that you're looking at the um, body cam video. I'm curious to know what you're seeing there. Does that tell any tell us anything? Uh, I'm, I'm seeing that the officers are responding to the jobs and they are handling them properly. And if there is an arrest to be made, they are making the arrest on the scene. Um, I'm also having officers reach out to uh, victims from the past that they might a house, let's say a household had a past domestic history. I'm having the officers take a proactive approach and call those households and see if there's anything that they want to talk about. Or we're also availing people um, that will meet them somewhere. If they don't feel comfortable talking at the house and they want to meet us you know, at a different location, or if they want to come in by the precinct, we can meet them, meet them outside the precinct or, you know, whatever would make them feel more comfortable that would try and help them out. We are availing them of that. I mean, the domestic violence officers are all dedicated. This is their mission. They have extensive training on how to um, talk to complainants and, and, and victims and try and you know, befriend them and, and let them know, listen, if you don't want it to, to us to help you per se, we can, we can give you the name of the advocacy groups. We can give you, you know, go to your clergy, go, go to your friends and family. There are a lot of different avenues. We are not the only avenue out there that can get you help, but we Absolutely. do want to get I'm you gonna on move the on. Um, Deputy Inspector, I'm going to move on. I think, um, I, I think we haven't quite answered the question. Um, and, uh, you know, I'd like to explore this further, but but we can move on for now. Um, Commissioner Noel, uh, just one quick question. Um, you know, I heard you say that, um, let's see, that, um, hang on one second, that the, the text, the COVID text number, um, 652-652, I can't remember what it is exactly, it sounds like it took until um, April 7th to get the first text out. And then over the past, uh, if you think of the pandemic as having gone on for at least seven weeks, there have been four texts that have gone out. Sounds like when they've gone out, they've been successful because you've gotten more hits um, to your website when they go out, which is really just terrific. But um, what I haven't heard in your testimony, and I wonder if you want to just speak to a little bit, is um, whether or not you think the agency is doing enough, whether or not um, there could be more that could be done. And I, I would love to, if not now, but at some point, uh, hear your sort of game plan for uh, what the agency is doing in preparation for when the pause is lifted. Okay. Um, so first I'd like to say that outreach to survivors is critical. And we started this with a clear understanding that we understand that um, survivors may have found it or may be finding it difficult to reach out for services now. So we looked at how we could stand up services as quickly as possible in two phases. The first phase was really thinking about what we could immediately push out looking at social media, thinking about the tools that we had at our fingertips at that point. And we did that through uh, Google and Twitter, and we were pushing out our messaging, letting folks know that we are open, the city is open, shelters are open, resources are here, our wonderful providers are here ready to serve. We stood up our FJC services and are really connecting in that way. And so a major part of pushing out that was in fact using the social media platform. And we had a large increase using social media. We, um, we saw a great uptick with um, uh, Google and Twitter and, 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 and we continue to see that. The second phase of our outreach will really look at how we can continue to amplify using those, those means, but also figure out how we can get our messaging into convenience stores and check cashing locations and laundromats and places that are open so we can actually put signage up so that they can really access services and know that services are available. 
And Thank we've you, also done um, a PSA with the First Lady and have pushed those things out as well. Have you gotten uh, a commitment for additional funding should demand uh, increase? We have gotten funding to uh, do the second phase of our plan. So to be able to really push that out to the places that I mentioned, convenience stores and check cashing and laundromat, we have gotten a commitment for that. And we will evaluate that impact as we go forward and, and evaluate our funding needs at that time. Okay, I'm gonna turn it over to my co-chair, Council Member Richards, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. I'm trying to turn it over to my colleague, Council Member Richards. Is Chair Richards there? Okay. Council Sergeant, do you see Chair Richards on the line? We do not, sir. He must have gotten knocked off. We'll get in touch with him. Okay. okay. Um, let's see. Uh, next, I'd like to call on in order Council Members Lanceman. Valone and Combo next, and I think we have a five minute clock. Thank you. And if, uh, if Chair Richards comes back on, we'll let him go after the person who's currently speaking is speaking. Go ahead, uh, Councilmember Lanceman. I'm Thank starting you. now. Thank you very much. Um, could you just go over what the uh, administration and various agencies or, or, or nonprofits at, at the admin's uh, direction is doing to proactively check in with um, prior domestic abuse uh, victims or individuals who had previously uh, called a, a hotline or had any interaction with the city or, or one of the nonprofits that we fund for a DV incident to make sure that, that they're okay, given how challenging it is for a, a DV victim cooped up with, uh, with her, his or her abuser um, to themselves maybe reach out. So part of what we do generally is safety planning with all survivors. Folks who come forward to the family justice centers, it's not a one-time call. Often, often our calls involve multiple times with the provider, providing counseling and services to children. Their needs evolve over time. Survivors let us know what they need. Sometimes they only need us once. Sometimes they need us multiple times. We go at the direction of survivors. That is the model. That is a client-centered trauma-informed model. Now, um, we check in as survivors determine that they need us. And well, let me, sorry, let me, let, me, let me just ask you, let me just interrupt. Uh, in, in light of the different environment that we're in, don't you think that it might be a good idea to at least identify some segment of the DV victim population, for want of a better term, that the city and nonprofit providers will, will affirmatively reach out to without waiting to be called and told, hey, I've got a problem? Survivors negotiate safety issues every single day. They negotiate safety issues with their abusers every single day. They let us know what they need and the duration and terms of how they need it. And that's what we seek to do. That's the level of engagement and that's how it's provided. We could call and it's unsafe and we make something more unsafe for a survivor in that situation. So we're always guided by the survivor's autonomy and ability to tell us what they need. And that's what we should be doing. Right. Um, one of the things I think, I think Helen and I might have had a hearing on this not too long ago, um, these batterer intervention programs, there are all sorts of programs that um, abusers are uh, asked to, in some cases required, to participate in so that they can uh, learn better behavior and, 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 and not uh, be an abuser. Um, what is the status of, of those programs now uh, that people can't leave their homes, um, is, has any model been developed whereby uh, people can participate in those programs in a meaningful way uh, online or, or remotely, or are just all of those programs uh, uh, on hold and in hiatus? 
I would defer to Mark Jay on that, who handles the abusive partner intervention programs. Okay. Um, we have passed in the council a law prohibiting um, making it a crime uh, for people to engage in revenge porn. And I've uh, heard and understand that, um, as one could imagine in this circumstance, um, online harassment, online abuse, um, some classic revenge porn, others just, just online harassment um, has increased, as, as one might imagine. Um, what is the city doing to target that phenomenon in, 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 in particular? We have a program with NYU Cornell Tech that really provides uh, digital and safety checkups for survivors on their phones, laptops, whatever that might be. We help them figure out if there's spyware on their phones that they can take off. We um, help them establish new uh, email accounts that, that the abuser may not have access to. We help them identify when their, their, their tech instruments, their, their devices are compromised and so that they can then begin to take some steps. We also do training with our uh, not-for-profit partners around how to include uh, tech and tech safety issues within the context of any kind of safety plan. Have, have those efforts and initiatives um, been enhanced and increased uh, during the current uh, crisis? And if so, how, how so and in what kind of measurable ways? Um, if survivors are experiencing cyber abuse, they can reach out to us for help and we're happy to connect them. Um, My time is Commissioner, expired. you, you can, can finish answer. your question. <laughs> you can finish your answer, please. Um, I did. What, you know, if, if survivors are experiencing any kind of tech abuse, they can reach out and we can connect them to services and help them manage that issue. Okay, we're going to turn it back to uh, Council Member Chair Richards um, for your question. Thank you, Council Member Rosenthal. I appreciate it. Sorry, somebody called me and we're all adjusting and I hit the wrong decline button. <laughs> um, so uh, to the NYPD, how many felony arrests have been made since COVID uh, has begun? All right, since, since uh, the current 28 day period, we have um, 2,157 arrests of which 900. How many, uh, go back again, how many? Arrests since COVID began. I'm going with the 28 day period, which is pretty much close to the uh, to the COVID time. We're looking at a total of 2,157 arrests, of which 950 were felonies and 1,205 were misdemeanors and two were violations. And like others, I am concerned. So thank you for that uh, question, uh, for that answer. Like others, I am concerned about underreporting. And I want to figure out if there's ways we can do better in ensuring that uh, victims could reach out for help. Uh, what is going on with text to 911? Okay, well, the texting to 911, that's an outside agency that is DeWitt, the Department of Information Technology and Telecommunications. And we have been working with them. Um, they are telling us that that will be operational in June. And they cannot, we cannot get it up any quicker than June. And would you agree to me, uh, agree with me that uh, text and 911 could be helpful in DV cases? I think uh, texting could be helpful in any cases. I, I, I specifically asked about uh, DV cases because text and 911 was supposed to be operational already. So we're going into June. And uh, yes, one of yes. the. Yes, and the answer to your question is yes, it would be helpful. Right. And uh, is there any. I would say, since text to 911 won't come out, are there any alternatives in the meantime um, when it comes to texting uh, DV uh, officers who 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 are uh, working day to day? Well, here's the problem with with that. You know, officers work in shifts. Um, then they, you know, we work 24 hours a day. The officers change. The numbers change. Um, who, who's going to be pulled from DV to go to patrol? Who, you know, who who responds? You know, is the, is it going to go to the desk? There's so many different 
ways that it could be done and all of those ways, the potential for it to fall through the cracks is immense. So that's why um, they're going to have it operational at the beginning of June, I believe. Um, you know, that's that's what we would be shooting for. If they could get my, it earlier, that would be great. Um, right. And I, I thank you for the work. And I know it's been a tough time, um, certainly. But do you think there are any alternatives uh, possible until text and 911 comes to on online? So we have DV officers, obviously. Uh, is it feasible for them to receive texts or to get no. their numbers up? The answer up? would be no. Why not? If they well, have, if every well, officer has uh, okay, a cell let's phone. Say I, let's say I text Officer Jones. He's working at eight to four. Officer Jones takes off today. Who's going to pick up that text? Where's that text right. going to go? You know what I mean? There's no, what if someone's not in the office to read that main number? The text comes into the, the domestic violence office, you know, and, and there's no one in the office. Let's say they got pulled for patrol or somebody is out sick or they're doing something else or, you know, they're on a lunch break or something. Where is that text going to go? It's going to sit in space and that person really needs help. If they really need help at that moment, they're going to have to call 911 or text a friend or a relative and, and, and have them call 911. We've set that up in all the trainings. You know, we, we've told them to make sure that you involve your coworkers, your family, your friends, your neighbors. If they get the, that text, maybe you could text a group, you know, like, and then somebody will get that call to 911. But we don't want to see, you know, texting to some officer, some officer, and they're reassigned or something happens and God forbid that text doesn't get read. How could we live with ourselves on that? That's terrible. You so know? Let, let me ask you this. So we have uh, uh, neighborhood police and NCOs, uh, and I know that they're not specifically trained in DB. Um, but one of the questions I would have is if we have neighborhood officers who are supposed to be responsive as well, uh, is there is it feasible to ensure that um, on because they're supposed to be res, uh, res, uh, responsive to communities 24 seven, I'm assuming unless I'm wrong, right. I believe the commissioner has said that um, are there ways to be creative in ensuring that uh, DV victims also have their numbers in the event, uh, because I believe, unless I'm wrong, and you could correct me if I'm right, wrong, I'm, I'm gonna, that I'm community uh, officers are supposed to be available 24-7. All right. E everyone in the police department is 24-7, and we all want to help. That's our mission in life, to help people, okay? We don't want to see anyone fall through the cracks. And yes, an NCO, everyone's supposed to be reading their phone 24-7. I'm supposed to look at my phone 24-7. What if I'm in a very deep sleep and I don't hear it go off or I put it on mute, uh, mute or vibrate and I don't hear it? You know, we, we can't have that, that small margin of error. You and I both know that that's when it's really going to hit the fan and happen. And that will get that ball will get dropped. And I don't want that on my conscience. And I don't think you want that on your conscience. You know, Absolutely not. That's why I want you to respond. So the, answer, the answer is no. <laughs> no, this is up and running. No, I don't want to do a, a slipshod half, you know what, job. I want to do it correctly from the get go. I want to put that out there and plug it and put it all over social media and get that program started on the right foot. I don't want to start it, you know, so so and, and something bad happens and, 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 and we, we, we're very upset by it. Um, we don't want to see that victim fall through the cracks. So well, let me ask you this, is there, is there a specific number in every precinct and maybe, you know, we, we have to think outside the box here, right? Uh, absolutely. Uh, it, and, I, and I do, right. I do is, that very well. Um, is, but, there, no. is there a specific, hold on, is there a specific number that you think we can be creative um, in, in, in creating for DV victims for local precincts? You know, we've tossed this around a ton of times since this all started. And, you know, the, the desk officer position is supposed to be manned 24-7. That desk officer gets up, walks away from the desk. That's when the text comes in, and we don't see it. And, and you know that it's not going to keep, you know. Hey, call, it. text. I don't care about Whatever. Call, text. All right, so let's get to call. Okay, so if you're calling, why wouldn't you just call 911? Uh, because not everybody can call 911. Let me, let me just go to this, too. Um, I found your statements on checking in and i'm assuming you track dv victims correct we do and we we check okay in. hold on okay. go ahead go ahead i'm sorry i was gonna say we check in with all victims
both the CVAPs check in with them and the uniform DVOs check in with them. And we also have been trying to think outside the box and see if there's households that have had prior violence, maybe not reaching up to the level of high propensity or, or children at risk lists, but maybe victims that have had, let's say multiple uh, misdemeanor felony assaults um, or that uh, the offender might have gotten out of jail you know, recently and, and he has a, a heavy domestic violence background or a very bad criminal background. We are trying to reach out to those households to let them know that we are here for them and to give them the safety and, training and, and that and, and let me let me just go back to your testimony. I think you testified that you check up on DV victims two to three times a month. Is that correct? Those are the high propensity children at risk and elderly households that have been designated the most at risk in every single precinct. Including uh, domestic violence victims, correct? Yeah, those are just domestic violence victims. They could a domestic violence victim could also be an elderly domestic violence. Right, victim. right. In children, I agree. Or children, yes, correct. Um, so, do you think that's do you think that's sufficient enough during a period when we're all locked in for well, COVID? I, I say that a minimum of two times a month, a minimum, and every precinct has a different amount of of individuals on that list, and those households are used to us checking up on them. That means that both the victim and the offender know that we check up on them. There's no secrets there. And so I, I do think that if we check up on them a minimum of two or three times. Um, you know, sometimes the, the offender doesn't live with them, you know, and, but if they are living with them, you know, they would let us know that and then we could check up on them more. Let me ask you a question. Was two to three on average a checkup before COVID? About two was, was the average before COVID, yes. All right. So do you think during COVID when people are locked in their homes every day that uh, an increase would be uh, certainly more sufficient in addressing? Forgive you. Forgive me if you hear my son in the background. Okay. Uh, uh, um, but uh, please uh, respond to me. If you were, hold on. If you were checking up two to three times before COVID, before a lockdown, do you think double that number at, on the very least, would be, be, would be sufficient in the event of a pandemic when people are uh, locked in their homes together with their abusers? Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say to you, it depends on the household and what's going on in the household. Does the offender live in that household currently? Also, we are, you know, six weeks into this pandemic. People are going out. They are going to the grocery stores, the pharmacies, the the parks. They are social distancing out in the street. So they are getting that breath of fresh air. The first two weeks, it seemed like everyone was in and it was almost a ghost town and you couldn't see anyone out on the street. Now you do see people coming out. So I think it's what's going on in that household and no one is better at knowing what's going on than those specialist DVOs in that precinct that deal with that family all the time. This, these families didn't just get added to this list this month. They've been on this list. They've been on our radar for months. We know who's living in that household, what's going on, what the backgrounds are of, of the, the offenders, the criminal backgrounds. Um, and, and what that family likes and how often they like to hear from us. Sometimes they want to talk on the phone. Sometimes they want to meet at a private location. Sometimes they don't necessarily want to see us at all. Um, but we do let them know of the different avenues that are available, whether it's advocacy groups, the FJCs, the clergy, their family and friends, and having the importance of those emergency plans in place that they should be able to text their family, friends, coworkers, and get 911 if they need it. There is planning that has been going on since day one when they have first put that complaint report in on that domestic incident report. It had, they, that family has been touched numerous times, but sometimes they like to even talk to the civilian advocates that work for Safe Horizon rather than necessarily talk to the DBOs, which, and by the way, they work hand in hand, the CVAPs and the DBOs, because they're in the same office together. They have a very intimate relationship of the households and, and the different parties that are there. And, and, and they know 
who the victim likes to talk to. Sometimes the victim feels much more comfortable talking to the civilian uh, victim advocate in the precinct as opposed to the DVO. As, as uh, how, as many, uniform. Sorry, how many? Sorry, how many? How many DVOs have been out since COVID? Okay, at the height of COVID, um, the week of April sixth, we had seventy-two DVOs out sick, which was seventeen point three one percent. Now, this week that we're in now, we have twenty-nine out sick, six point nine percent. So we are getting better. We are getting closer to full strength. And, and who filled their positions when seventy-two percent? Uh, to nearly 73% were out. Who well, filled those positions? Okay. And, and this is something that the NYPD does very good. We do more with less. And we we do what we need to no, do. No, I didn't ask you more to less question. I asked you how, who, who okay, well, filled. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to spin did that. Did we have back. replacements? No, we did not. In fact, you know what? The okay. total number of DVOs, we know that patrol was crushed when this epidemic started. Okay? And we had a backfill patrol with all the specialty units, whether it's anti-crime, DVOs, community policing, NCOs, um, you know, everyone had to jump in the game and multitask. All right, so- Got um, it, got it. So 73% were out. No, 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 uh, no, 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 time out, time out. 72, sorry, go ahead. 72 DVOs were out, which was 72, 17% of my- 17%. Right. Um, and who filled those positions? I'm sorry. No one filled those positions. We no one did. Sure, okay. we always had one or two in every precinct. Some precincts, you know, that it, it all each DV office runs on how many DIRs come in. You know, so the busier precincts have more. They might have a sergeant and ten DVOs. The slower precincts might only have one, one or two DVOs. So it's it, it's it's driven by the data. So we tried to ensure that there was always one or two DVOs in the precinct at all times to handle complaints. All right, so but, can we get, can the council get a breakdown of how many were out, who replaced them by precinct? And I'm not, I don't wanna hold this because I, I know we have a lot of people yeah. uh, who wanna testify. And then my other question is, uh, what is the relationship with CBOs on the ground who possibly can fill these gaps? And if the NYP was, NYPD was actually giving them uh, additional assistance or the mayor's office uh, to fill the gaps that we might have seen. So I don't want to hold this up, um, but your answers to me are insufficient. If 70% of uh, DVOs were out and we didn't fill uh, those positions, uh, we endangered lives in our in our city, and that's and there's a direct correlation between uh, the reduction in DVOs and also arrest and ar arrest down in in domestic violence. As we all know, is not necessarily good, especially when people are locked in during a pandemic. So I I'm not here to attack you. We're here to find a common goal. And, uh, and and I see you getting a little uptight. It's okay. No, 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 I'm not. I'm not here. I want you to relax. No, no. We all have the. We council all member. share. Hold right. on. We so all council share the same. I, I hold on. Know. Hold on. I'm and talking. We talk. all share the same common goal all in ensuring that we can protect domestic. But so we're all on the same team. I just want to put that okay, out there. Time out. Time out. I want to. I want to. And I'm going to get time out. But the mere fact that we had DVOs out and we didn't fill those positions in a meaningful well, way means that we have people cooped up in their apartments oh, or in no, their no, homes no, right not, now with their oh, attackers. Council member, those are your words. They are my they, words, but they are facts. fact. did not say that they weren't filled in a meaningful way. The chief did say that the job- She just told me they weren't right. filled, so Excuse tell me, me how they were filled. Excuse me, I was speaking. So the chief has answered your question to keep repeating the same question and mis and misinterpreting her answers. And I'm not misinterpreting. I'm, I'm, what, I'm, no, I'm a very doing. intelligent well, young man. Said, I think I'm interpreting it the right way that 17% of DVOs were I'll out and we didn't have a meaningful way no, that, that's of filling not what, those positions. You said that there wasn't any, anything meaningful. That's not what we said. So what she said was that much like the rest of the department, there is a historic pandemic going on. We've lost Agreed. seven members of the service. We've had 19, upwards of 20% of our department out sick. 
thousands of officers stricken with the virus. In the, in the midst of all of that, that included DVOs and included detectives, included Agree. parole officers, and we were doing our job. Our officers were out there. They were out there making arrests. They were out there communicating with domestic violence victims. How many arrests were made? Felony arrests were made over DB. We keep repeating ourselves, but I'm in the middle of my answer now. So we were doing our jobs. We were responding to DB calls. We were making arrests. The numbers did fluctuate. And I think over time, we're going to try to realize, and I think it's not only the NYPD, but advocates and experts and academics are going to try to make sense of why radio runs were up, arrests are down, complaints are down. Mm -hmm. One of the points that Chair Rosenthal made in the beginning is some victims are holding back, maybe uh, delivering their complaint until the time is right for them. Maybe that will be one of the answers that we're going to come to. At the end of the day, we have put in protocols internally to include re reviewing body-worn cameras to make sure that the radio runs that we're responding to are responded to in the, in the right way. Whenever there is an opportunity to make an arrest, we make an arrest. But we are dealing with a crisis. And to, mm -hmm. to sell this as if we're somehow, there are officers that are out sick and we're neglecting our responsibilities and not responding to calls or not making arrests when there is an arrest to be made, that's just false. You're, that, that's incendiary. I didn't, I didn't insinuate so that, 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 but that's what- That's absolutely incendiary. That, and you're leaving victims with a misperception that if they call 911, if they call the police, that we're somehow going to inadequately respond to them. That's inappropriate. Well, well let me get back to text. Hold on. Let me get back to text 911, Oleg. So where are we at with text 911? Will we see that in early years? We keep going in a circle. The chief answered that question. Do it as Hold on. No, I want you to answer that question. Or right, text to 911 going to be ready by June. Do it is handling that project. That's not a PD project. And the last we heard is text the 911 will be up and running in June. And I live in the real world. There's no abuser that can call 911 with their abuser in the house. So I, I don't know what world you're living in. We live but in the, in, the, in the real in the world I live in, we live um, in it would be world. very complicated for victims to be able to pick up their phone and call 911. So that's why I want to stress and that's why text to 911. It's really hard to get text to 911 up and running. It's going to be made up and running in a safe way to ensure that no call slips through the cracks. It wasn't rushed through to leave a victim calling 911 with nobody on the other end to answer their call. So it was done prudently, diligently. The city took their time to make sure that the system, the text to 911 system put in place was a sound system that worked, that didn't leave anybody unanswered. And that system is going to be up and running in June. And, and, uh, and every victim that a domestic incident report had prepared on them during this whole pandemic, they got a phone call by the CVAP and by the DVOs. So there was follow up on everything. If there was an arrest to be made, um, it could have been a timing issue of when a 61 was dropped and the squad picks up someone later on. Maybe they weren't at the house when we went to make an apprehension. But every victim who did file a report did have the prudent, quick, timely follow up. So I, right. know, I want you to understand that. I you agree. Know, I agree. And, and I'm not and, discounting and radio that. Runs, radio runs right. could also be up. Because during the pandemic, victims did not walk into the precinct. They could have called 911, or they could also have victim neighbors are calling 911 as well. So right. you know, a lot of times victims do come in to the precinct and go right up to the to the squad or the DV office. So let me let me let me just say this, and I want to end because I know my colleagues have questions. Sure. But for you to say to me that, um, one, that your desk officers are walking away from their desk and they can't answer the phone is unacceptable. Well, and then the other, hold on, hold on. I didn't finish. I didn't finish my statement. Is, is there hold a on, hold on. One door? I didn't, I didn't oh. finish my statement. I'm going to let you, you know, let me finish my statement. So desk right. officers who are assigned to a precinct, a local precinct, should absolutely at the at the mere least, as as I do with my staff, they better answer the phone. One person walks away. Hold on, 
they better have somebody else who can answer the phone. Yes, hold on. And then secondly, lastly, um, I, I would add to that, that checking up on DV victims two to three times a month is unacceptable. We need to make sure that we're ramping that up. And whether that means you get more civilians, I know the NYPD is hiring another class of officers. Perhaps we need to look at civilian uh, hires so that we can ensure that people are checking up two times to three times the amount of times that they did prior to COVID because people are locked in their homes with their attackers. So I just wanted to make that clear. I'm not, I'm not here to attack you. We're on the same side on this issue. I want the NYPD to have 100% success here. So I don't want you, and I understand the challenges around staffing and everything else, but we need to find um, a common ground here to ensure that we're protecting DV now, victims, LGBTQ two, victims. Two to three times, that's on the DVOs. There's also additional times by the CVAPs. So it is more than two to three a month if you add the two together. Well, that's not it what you said to me earlier. I'm, I'm giving you what you, you gave me. You asked me about the DVOs, <laughs> you asked me about the DVOs, not the CVAPs. Yeah, I mean, Alrighty. if I can just follow up. The Sorry. question was, what's the change between pre-COVID and during COVID? Just to be clear, of course, the CVAPs are making their calls as well. The question by Council Member Richards was, what's the change now the high propensity victims have always been at a high propensity for violence it's just not the answer to the question and maybe the answer to the question is there is no change with covid that's fine but just be clear there is the same number it's the same number well, Thank we you. Worry about them before. And I think this the about. other point, just to follow up on Councilmember Richards' uh, other point, is if you the the DVOs are specially trained to do their work, and they do an amazing job. Uh, it is concerning that the number of complaints taken and arrests are down. That's just a fact. I'm not. I, I'm, I'm reporting what you're reporting. The complaints are down, the arrests are down, and of course, that's concerning. One could think that if the DVOs are out, totally understandable, that the POs who make those runs perhaps are not as equipped to deal with this very bizarre situation of COVID laden on top of a DV situation. And I think what we are suggesting and, and hoping we can hear from the PD is uh, we recognize there's a difference with COVID. We recognize that uh, complaints in all three areas are down, right, in DV. We have rape complaints, felony and misdemeanor complaints all down. Arrests are down. Uh, what we want to hear is that you recognize it and that you're doing everything you can to, uh, and, and what we want to hear is what exactly you're finding as you look at those metrics and what you're doing to deal with that. So, you know, and saying that you've reviewed the body cams and they all look right really doesn't answer the question. Then what is going on if complaints are down? In other words, the report taken when you get to the door. So I all we're saying is those questions are valid questions and they've not been answered yet. Um, uh, yeah, Nothing uh, more. Chair. No casting aspersions. Chair, so I, I think uh, I think your point is right, and the chief mentioned that in her testimony, that we recognize that DV has always been a historically underreported crime. So when we see the numbers uh, drop, you know, the complaint numbers drop off, we are concerned. And that's why we're, and she said clearly in her testimony, we're not taking it to mean that, oh, the numbers have dropped, so therefore DV seems to, the crime is going down. 
we're actually concerned that the numbers are dropping. So they are following up with, with the DV victims. We are, uh, we are reviewing body cameras. I mean, that's not something to be made light of. It's to your point. No, no, no. I'm not saying you're making light of it. But I'm, I'm just saying it's not good enough to say we looked at the body cams no, and everything's I, I, fine. That, that's why that's just one of the things that we're doing, right? So, but it's an important thing. To your point that you just made, if the DVOs are out sick, if there's a good large number of DVOs that are out sick and police officers are responding to these runs, which mind you, the police officers were always responding to the radio runs, the patrol officers, the DVOs were doing the follow-ups. But it's important to look at the body worn camera video to ensure that during this pandemic that nothing is slipping through the cracks that this is the something by quarter. definition something is slipping through the cracks just by definition that how, that's how all we're that, saying how is that by definition because complaints are down okay but i i we can't reach that conclusion now that something's slipping through the cracks it could be that complaints are down because victims aren't making complaints. The question is, why but are- But your radio runs are up. So someone's calling 911. But it could also be for, by neighbors calling 911. I, I heard that. I heard that. Right. So the that's drop the best. in complaints and the drop in arrests, it, there is a statistical, statistically significant drop. Yes. But we're going to move on so other people can ask questions. We're saying the same thing over and over. I'm not hearing an answer. Uh, you're not hearing why I don't hear an answer. So let's move on to the next person. Um, but I think we have a little work here to do. Okay. Councilmember Vallone, I think you were up next. And then Councilmember Combo, Chair, uh, Majority Leader Combo, we've also been joined by um, Councilmembers Kalos, Gibson, Deutsch, uh, Rivera and, and Rivera. Oh, no, not Councilmember Rivera. My bad. All right, Councilmember uh, Vallone. Thank you, Alan. I'm Thanks. sorry. That, uh, okay, I'm sorry. You can begin. Okay. Thank you to our co chairs, Helen Rosenthal and Donovan Richards, and our speaker. Uh, thank you to NYPD and the mayor's staff that are here today. Uh, first, we have, we're all in agreement to thank you for everything that you're doing to keep us alive in the city during these times. So uh, I want to personally thank every one of our first responders in the NYPD for everything you're doing and the staff that's doing the work that Helen and Donovan are bringing out today. Um, one thing that came up between uh, Rory's and Helen and Donovan's, the, the providers that are actually handling the DV work, uh, some of them in my district that are handling this are telling me their calls are up over 300 percent so i just want to make sure we're on the same even though maybe 911 calls are down i have uh providers telling me that the last five weeks they've gotten over 300 percent increase but they're also being told that as as of today and maybe you could clarify for me and for them are they still category categorized as not um essential service because right now they're, they're they're having difficulty working under the conditions because they haven't been classified as an essential service at this point. Uh, I'm, I'm under the... uh, DV providers who are working. We have reached out to our contractors who are who are deemed as essential services and have been working with them to be able to. Um, figure out whatever their COVID needs are and address those appropriately. Well, so is that that they are classified as essential services because I, I'm being told that they haven't been done that yet. So if we can coordinate and make sure that, that is lifted, that would be a big help uh, in their ability to address these concerns. Um, we are we could, con we're constantly looking at that and we are really assessing um, the COVID response, looking at residential program providers and really uh, discussing what, if any, uh, modifications need to be made to their budgets to be able to um, honor any reasonable or additional costs that they have incurred uh, due to COVID. Well, that, that's, that's encouraging. And I just want to thank Helen and Donovan for bringing this up because, uh, for example, I have the Korean American Family Service Center of Queens and their 
they're looking for that help. They have over 300% uh, increase in DV calls and it's at crisis stage uh, here in Northeast Queens and Queens. So um, clearly there's a need for this hearing. Clearly there's a need to connect the, the services that are trying to be provided and what's done. So if you can maybe just end by saying how we I can make that connection. I would encourage uh, that service provider to reach out to the agencies that hold that contract and, and talk to them about what they're seeing and what, and, and what some of their needs are. Thank you. Thank you, Helen. Thank you, Donovan. Thank you so much. Majority Leader Cumbo. Time starts now. Majority Leader Cumbo, are you unmuted? No, I don't think she's unmuted yet. Yeah, she's not unmuted yet. Unmute myself. There you go. Okay. I can hear you, Majority Leader. Uh, thank you so much for doing this timely hearing. I, I really was holding on uh, because I wanted to, obviously, the text 911 is my bill. And I couldn't be more excited that I have champions on the council that are advocating and fighting harder for my bill than I ever could. So I, I thank you all for that because I just want to add how uh, critical uh, the ability to have text 911 is at this critical time and I certainly stand at, and associate myself with the words of Councilmember uh, Donovan Richards in terms of making sure that this is expedited because the challenge that we face is that it has been one of those it's coming online next year it's coming online next month it's coming online and it's constantly been about to come um, and this legislation was passed in our, our last term. So while I recognize that it's in do it, we certainly want to make sure that you're doing all that you can um, to continuously uh, make sure that um, this is pushed through as quickly as possible. I wanted to ask, and, and I apologize, I'm here with my son, and so I've been a bit in and out in terms of a lot of the questions that are being asked. What are the options currently now in terms of, and, and if this has been asked, I certainly, please just inform me, in terms of if there are people in dangerous situations um, as far as uh, calls that are being made that the police department um, are responding to, because of the situation with COVID, have there been additional spaces, places, safety spaces, um, housing options that are now more readily available than ever before? Uh, do you mean when, when calls come in from 911 um, and then we form them to the domestic violence officers that we meet victims at a different location if they so request, if they don't feel comfortable with us coming into their homes or they don't want us, you know, to, us to be seen at their homes, we do make those provisions to meet them at a different location of their, you know, of a, of a mutual uh, understanding to help them. We do that. Thank you. So what happens now if, if you've discovered that there's a case, a dangerous situation, someone stepped out, they've met you at this disclosed location, previously pre-COVID, all of the housing options were book solid. Everyone had a very difficult time with actually leaving their abuser because there were very few housing options available. Have we opened up, I'm just making examples of these questions were asked, have we further opened up our hotels, other safety spaces, and other things like that that now make it easier? Because the challenge prior to COVID was that the housing stop, particularly for DV, was so packed and the waiting list was so long that oftentimes people didn't come forward because the understanding would be there's really no place else to go. You're going to have to return home. So my question is, at this time, are there more? Oh no, come back. We're, we need to unmute the majority leader again. Okay, you hear me? Yeah. Okay, so are there more safe spaces in uh, a COVID world right now at this time than there were pre-COVID? Can, can I, um, this is Commissioner Noel, and I'd yeah. first like to say that uh, domestic violence shelters are open, services are available. But I'd also like to uh, defer to HRA, who is here as well, to answer that specifically. 
I thank you, uh, <clears throat> Majority Leader. To answer your question, um, as Commissioner Noel just stated, um, we have capacity in the emergency shelter system uh, for those individuals who might require uh, immediate placement uh, in one of those uh, shelter options. Um, I think something that you're asking is slightly different. You're asking about housing options. Um, I would just say that um, our HRA offices that <clears throat> are processing housing applications for rental assistance remain open. Um, we've stood up an opportunity to be able to work with landlords to do uh, remote viewings for apartments uh, when linking somebody to rental assistance and ensuring um, that they're able to move out into permanent options as well. So I just want to be clear about that because I think that information is really important. Are you saying that in this time right now, there is an opportunity if you're in a situation where you can no longer live with your abuser and you and your family have to leave, are you saying that there are housing opportunities that are available for them if they wanna leave that day? And what you're saying is that there are, there's shelter housing available? I'm just sorry. Please, uh, this is an important question, council member, please continue. Um, can you still hear me? Yeah. I think it's important. I think, it's, I think a lot of things are important. It's important for us to be able to outline clearly to the New York City worldwide, if you're having issues that housing is an option, there is some place that you can go temporarily for support, for services, for temporary shelter. And so I just want to make sure that that is actually the case um, and that it's very streamlined in terms of how they go about doing that. And, and I also say it from the place of, we hear very much about the, the uptick in domestic violence, but we're, we're not hearing at the same level. We understand that there is an uptick in violence. We have some place for you to go. I think that's a critical part of this so that people know there is an option and that there is some place for them to go. That it's not you're gonna be returned back to the same household um, where the incident is taking place. Because, you know, for me, if I were in that situation and I knew that I'd have to return back to the same home, I probably wouldn't report it because you would infuriate the person um, who you've called this upon and not have any place to go at that point. And I guess because of COVID, what, I mean, what kind of provisions are being made for someone to move if they have to leave their home very quickly and rapidly in that way? What's important, I think, to understand is that part of our messaging out there is that one, that we're open, two, that services are available. Part of safety planning includes figuring out how we help you exit that situation that you need to do safely. It, it um, part, part of safety planning will include linking you to the hotline to find that placement that you need in the borough that's safe in the area that's safe. It's really working with the survivor where they are and really strategizing with them on how to leave safely and how to access the system that they need to. Are the, is the shelter for DV um, victims have all the precautions and uh, dynamics been taken into place in terms of COVID? Because I yeah. would be concerned as an individual leaving my, you know, you're looking at it from a place of, I'm, I'm jeopardizing my health of, and my safety of my family in this home, but I may also be jeopardizing my health and my family that's in right. this shelter that's unknown that I know nothing about. What are, are the dynamics in the shelters also places where we're saying these particular DV shelters are safe havens, they are safe, you will be protected, you will have the privacy of your own um, space, your own uh, housing opportunity, like you're going to be in a space that is safe, as reasonable as possible um, under the, the current COVID circumstances. 
Sure. Thank you for the questions. I was having a bit of difficulty the last couple of minutes uh, unmuting, so I was not able to respond. Thank you to Commissioner Noel for jumping in there. Um, <clears throat> the vast majority of the domestic violence shelter system is set up with apartments and private bathrooms. Um, there is a subset that does include um, shared kitchens and bathrooms. Um, I want to make it abundantly clear to these committees and to the individuals who are listening and watching at home in respect to the guidance that we've provided uh, to, <clears throat> excuse me, our contracted providers about um, the guidance from DOHMH in respect to um, congregate locations um, and the necessity to maintain social distancing, um, cleaning those, those areas, communications for um, the sites that do have congregate bathrooms or kitchens, the necessity of staggering meal times to be communicating with one another um, to ensure social distancing. But I want it to be abundantly clear um, that, you know, we have not heard from providers um, that there are instances uh, in which uh, there are concerns. If, if folks are hearing otherwise, we do need to hear that information so we can work with providers. Um, if somebody is unable to isolate in one of our locations, um, DSS has stood up isolation capacity. Um, we talked about that in, some, in great extent last week at a DHS hearing on the subject. Um, but we've been in regular communication with our providers um, to make sure that the communities and those impacted individuals know um, that there are safe options available for those who are in need um, in our emergency domestic violence system. I'll, I'll just conclude with a statement and I, and I thank you so much for your clarity on the answer. I think it's really important when we're, there's been a lot of back and forth in terms of things slipping through the cracks and not understanding the low reporting, but knowing that the abuse is actually higher. Yeah. I think that we have to ramp up um, the information that we're sending out about what to do and what's available and that you're going to be in a safe space and that we understand that it's COVID and we understand that you're making a choice between leaving your home, which is unsafe and going to a new space that you don't know if it's gonna be safe. Like all of that information somehow needs to get filtered to the community that going into a shelter, if you've never been in one, may seem like you're going into a room or a space with a hundred beds and they're all in one room and you're gonna be sleeping on a cot next to someone. Like if you've never been, you don't know. So sure, and I, I appreciate that um, across neither the HRA system or DHS system, does that environment exist? Um, across the HRA system, uh, families and singles are placed in their own unit. Uh, some of which, as I just mentioned, the majority have a self-contained bathroom and kitchen. Um, and there's a, a smaller subset that does not. And as I indicated, uh, we provided clear guidance about maintaining social distancing in those environments uh, to exactly address the concern. And I think it's all um, incumbent upon each of us to be messengers of that safety in these environments. So that way, if an individual um, is, you know, has the opportunity to leave uh, an abuser uh, and enter into the domestic violence shelter system, that they take it and there isn't mixed messaging. So. We're happy to provide additional information to this committee about what was uh, provided um, as guidance to our providers. It's posted on the DOHMH website um, and certainly happy to answer any questions so we can all be stewards of accurate and precise messaging around this. Just because people are watching and viewing, and this might be like the greatest information that they've gotten, if you're facing a situation in an abusive household or relationship, do you call 911 or do you call the mayor's office to combat domestic violence? Do you call one of the providers? What is your first touch point in terms of how to deal with this? And once you and if you do decide that you're going to call the police first, do they then streamline the process to get you into housing? Okay, first and foremost, if you are in danger, if if your life if you are at risk at serious risk, you should call 911. You should reach out and have that response. Um, police are trained. They will take the complaint. They will follow up. And also, you can reach out to the domestic violence hotline. Um, you can go to NYC Hope and actually be able to speak with someone who is not law enforcement, 
who can talk about some of those other services. Not that law enforcement can't, they certainly can. And they are well aware of those services and well aware of all the numbers and give them out all the time. But they can also call directly to the hotline. They can, if they, if they don't want to speak to someone, they can go to NYC Hope and look for resources and find resources within the community. Not every, I, I, I think it's important for us just to ground ourselves a little bit in understanding that survivors are, are, have the autonomy, have the ability to choose, and they do. And they negotiate safety for themselves and their children every single day. And yes, it is more challenging during COVID and we understand that. And the importance of getting the messaging out is truly, truly important. And we want to do that. But not every survivor wants a law enforcement response and not every survivor is ready to go to shelter. Many survivors just want information. They want to understand their options. They want to be able to think about what the next step could be, understand that step and reach out to providers and think about that. And remember that all of our FJCs are open and available to do that work as well. Um, I'm going to keep going here, if that's okay with you, Majority Leader Combo, and move on. We have next council members um, uh, Cabrera and then Lanceman again. And if any other council members would like to ask questions, please, please do so by raising your hand in the um, participant list. Uh, thank you so much uh, to the uh, chairs and to the speaker. Uh, I just want to just review a couple of things here, uh, just for the record. Oleg, uh, help me understand this. Uh, if I heard you right, uh, the situation with the 911 uh, is not because of a held up by the NYPD, it's solely because of do it. Well, I mean, I. I, I'm not blaming do it. The point, the no, point I was making is that, I just want to find out where it's happening. Right. So the agency that's heading the uh, upgrade or conversion to text the 911 is doing. They're doing the citywide. Uh, they're the citywide project leader in doing it. Um, they have set the go date as as June of this year. We're definitely a customer. Uh, I'm sure as so is uh, the fire department, EMS, and so on of the text the 911 system. But we're, do, we're certainly doing our part because there is a certain level of training that goes on for, for the PCTs and so on. So we have a role in it and you know they're standing up the technology. We're back, we're doing the back end in terms of making sure that our folks know how to use it and to ensure that nobody slips through the cracks that uses the text the 911 system. But you have done your peaks. That's that's what I'm asking, right? Yeah, yeah. I think we're working in we're working together. Yes, yes. Okay. I I, I just want to make sure that we're not demanding of an agency something that they have no control over at this point. And so it really comes down to do it, and the discussions need to take place with do it for them to uh, be able to expedite because we definitely uh, need it. The second thing is I wanted to ask you, because uh, there was a really good question regarding uh, the most sensitive cases, right? That normally they get three calls. What are the best practices that you see nationwide? And uh, are we among the best practices during the COVID-19 uh, season that we're going through right now? Well, we've, we've been in contact with other law enforcement agencies around the country. We read the you know, weekly newsletters of all the different practices. Um, we're all on board with most of them the same practices because they have been, you know, proven over and over again to work. Um, so we also send our offices to seminars across the country. We've been doing that for the last couple of years to, to, to talk with other law enforcement uh, agencies and see what the back, best practices are that they employ and we share our practices with, with them and so forth. And um, I think that we do have some really great practices going on right now. We, we have weekly strategy meetings with the mayor's office to NGBV and different advocacy groups, clergy groups, and collaborative uh, community policing with um, Commissioner Parker so that we can all be on board and have the same exact format that we're using. Um, you know, again, to, to, to go with Commissioner Noel, she said that, you know what, victims, victims, 
are like, they're absorbing all this information that we're giving them. We're reaching out to them, we're visiting them. They're, we're first interacting with the 911 job, then the DVOs and the CVAPs are calling them. We're giving them the numbers for the FJCs and the different agencies and they're calling them and they are going to do what is best for themselves and their families when they're ready to do it. You know, we want them to get the help and, and get out of those dangerous situations. But the bottom line is they're going to do it when they wish to do it. And we have to be respectful, especially in a pandemic when they are worried about illnesses, money, dislocation, their children. There's a lot of factors at play here. It's not always that simple as just say, Let's call 911 and make an arrest immediately and be done with this. That's not how it is. The very fluid, long-term planning process. So, so because um, I only get five minutes. Uh, so, the question, maybe to ask it in a different way, is um, a more defined way: is the numbers that you saw before with the most cancer uh, uh, cases that they get three phone calls a month. Have you seen a, a disparity or uh, in terms of those cases uh, becoming more dynamic or have you seen pretty much the same because you are applying the same practices that you have before? Okay, um, in answer to that, we have nominated those households as households at risk. And that's because of past incidents that have happened. And we do check on them. Like I said, that's a minimum of two to three times a month, minimum. Sometimes we get more visits in, sometimes they call us, et cetera. All right. Because Bye. we are checking in, they, they are being handled. Those households are not seeing an increase in violence because those offenders know that we are watching what is going on in that household. I mean, I think, and, and just to finish off on the answer to the council member, I, I think what you're trying to get at and the, the answer is we're not shortchanging any household. If it looks like a household mm -hmm. needs more than the minimum in terms of visits, that's what they're getting. But that seems like the two to three minimum a month historically has seemed to be the right recipe, but that's mm -hmm. not a one size fits all. Sometimes there's a household that needs more and we're there and we're certainly going to provide more. And the other piece, just to finish off uh, to your very first question about the text of 911, I don't want to I don't want there to be to leave with a misconception that a city agent do it or any other city agency was sitting on their hands and they could somehow, you know, flip a switch and do it a lot faster. And they haven't been. That just hasn't been the case. This is a very it's a difficult process because we can't make a mistake. That's the key. You need to build a system that's a sound system that ensure you need to test the system before it goes live to ensure that if uh, somebody that's calling for in the, in the course of an emergency needs help from a first responder, that that call gets received on the other end. And that testing, that building out, testing, training, it takes time and we didn't want to rush through it and get it going before it was ready to go live. So we're all working together, the PD, the FD, do it. Everybody's working together to get it up and running as quickly as humanly possible. And it's not the fault of any agency. I just want to make sure, make sure that that's clear. I'll run out of time. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, Council member uh, Kalos and then council member Menchaca. Or actually, Council Member Kalos, have you been unmuted? No, not yet. I think actually, been oh, unmuted. there you thank go. Thank you very much. Thank you to Chair Rosenthal. Uh, thank you to uh, Chair Richards. I wanted to just touch on two quick items. Um, I One of the first things I did was a council member as I set up text-based constituent services because uh, one of my colleagues, Council Member uh, Cabrera, already had it. It is one of the most uh, straightforward pieces. I guess the piece I'm a little lost on is we have two 911 centers, and um, folks are already on computers. Uh, there's already a way of distributing phone calls to the operators. Um, 
why aren't we able to distribute the uh, text message? Like, just to be very clear, you, you buy a text messaging gateway. The text messaging gateway pretty much has unlimited bandwidth for text messages. They're very small. They're very easy to send. We've actually built them for other states. And then it's just a matter of having the training, but you already have the trained operators. So I guess, what is the hold up in just getting the text messaging gateway, which literally I could build for you this afternoon uh, to feed messages to your operators? I mean, council member, I'm, I'm certainly not the person qualified or running the project to answer that question for you. Um, I know that there is a, uh, a report that's mandated, I believe by uh, council member Combo's legislation that gives a status report on what's being done year over year uh, or, or maybe semi-annually to get uh, text 911 up and running. Uh, but I would defer to do it uh, to explain more the technology and what, what the impediments are or you know to getting a system live what i can tell you from the first responder from the pb standpoint yes as you mentioned there is the training piece which we have done and two uh there is conceptually the process when it stands up it's something that's new something that's not hasn't been done before in new york city we want to ensure that when a text emergency text comes in that somebody receives it and we dispatch services to the right location. I think I, I appreciate your answer. I think that's the same answer you previously given. I think I'm just saying that a text and a phone call are very similar and that the technology exists to just route it. Uh, my, my other question is uh, regarding what resources are available to folks who might be watching at home, who might be in a, a domestic violence situation and they're concerned about going to a shelter, uh, they're concerned about employment, maybe they've lost their jobs, and so now is not a great time, uh, but maybe there's an opportunity to do a video visit because there's a, it's a crisis right now and they say, I, I wanna talk to somebody. What resources short of having to leave for shelter are available that somebody can pick up the phone right now or text right now to get resources for their family so that they can try to resolve situations and try to come back together with a partner? That is a great question. And one of the first things they can do is reach out to our family justice centers. They're in every borough. We can connect them to services. We can give counseling. We can provide legal consultation. We can connect them to shelter if they wanna be connected to shelter. So it is a multi-service entree to be able to help a survivor both assess the situation, safety plan, and then connect to services if they need that. If they are sure that they want to go into shelter, they can call um, um, the, the, the New York City hotline and, and be connected to a shelter. They can also go to NYC Hope, which is our, our, our resource directory. They can look up services. They can call services within their community and get connected that way. There are multiple ways that survivors can connect. And that's what I think that we all need to make sure that they hear. And they also need to hear that we are here, we are responding, NYPD is responding, shelters are open, and they should reach out if they need services. What is the number for the New York County uh, Family Justice Center? And if, if I'm coming in to be an essential worker in Manhattan, can I use the New York County uh, Family Justice Center? Yes, you can use the New York County Family Justice Center. And let me just pull up that number because each of the numbers are different, but I will get that for you and give you that in just a moment. And for Manhattan is too And uh, for, for our website, so, so let's just be clear, while we get that number, uh, they can also go to our website, which is nyc.gov slash NYC Hope. Um, and, and they can find our, our, our numbers there as well, or they can call the domestic violence hotline, which is 1-800-1-4673. And for New York County's um, Family Justice Center, let me just get that number. 212-602-2800. And just to repeat, because time was called 800-621-HOPE. Uh, HOPE spells out 4673. And if I may have That's just correct. an extra moment, I just wanted to ask, uh, 
during this time, are video visits available for your resources so that folks don't have to travel into a family justice center? And then similarly, if they do choose to travel in, and I, I have a small two-year-old, I don't want her to get coronavirus, uh, what are the ratios, what safety precautions are being taken so that we don't get coronavirus while we're trying to get other type of safety? So family, so family justice centers have, have transitioned to virtual intake and processing. So all you have to do is, is call the number that right now we're temporarily closed due to COVID, but they can call and get that, that service. And the number for, uh, uh, the number for Manhattan is 212-620-2800 for the Manhattan Family Justice Center. I'm going to go um, now to Council Member Menchaca. I know that you've been waiting for a while and your technology dropped you off, but you're back. Council Member Menchaca. Uh, Chair I'm Rosenthal. Um, oh, yeah. Just, just one second. I just want to repeat the number because I think I said that very quickly. Again, the, the number for the Manhattan Family Justice Center is 212-602-2800. Thank you very much. Uh, Council Member Menchaca. Thank you, uh, Chair and Chairs and everyone involved in making this hearing possible. I want to direct our attention to the immigrant community, uh, an immigrant community who has been part of the massive essential response and who are being left behind by many of the federal and state and uh, what we're trying to fix here in the city as well. And I want to talk specifically about DV cases uh, that will trigger ICE agent enforcement. Uh, immigrant communities, especially the survivors, are feeling a chilling effect. And we've been hearing this. Uh, so I'm glad we're having this, this opportunity to have a conversation with both you, Commissioner, and the Deputy Chief. Um, they're having a chilling effect that is preventing them from calling 911 or activating any of the DV services. The immigrant community has been um, uh, I think a difficult community to connect to services, period. We're seeing that in the census uh, response, immigrant communities are not responding. And so this is, this is a, I think a, a big issue and, but I wanna focus on the DV piece. Uh, so how is the NYPD and the mayor's office, uh, you commissioner dealing with this as you encounter retaliatory actions from ICE? Well, I first want to just talk about our relationships with providers because we have a robust uh, community of providers who serve immigrant communities who are very connected each to our family justice centers and also to, um, to all the services that we deliver. They are a, a major piece of all that we do. All the work that we do with clients at the family justice center is safe and confidential, period. Um, we do not disclose that information at all. Um, so, and we tell that to um, um, our our survivors who come through the door, and they know that, and we and we stand by that in every way. Okay. So, and I and I appreciate that, and I know that that's true. I guess what I'm saying is we are, um, and I'm. I guess I'm talking about very recently. ICE has been. Um, and I'm talking about in the last month and a half has been active still, and we've been fighting that in a big in a big way. Uh, and we have heard of a report that someone, a survivor who had called and engaged in the system, uh, was engaged by ICE at their home. And that is what I'm talking about. That kind of stuff has has been uh, spoken about in our communities. And so I want to I want to address that. Not the general. You're open to to immigrants. That's true. It's, it's about that. Is that on your radar, one? Uh, and two, how are you responding to that? Uh, and this is maybe more for, for Deputy Chief. And because I only have two minutes, I'm going to ask my second and final question uh, in this five minutes, which is the letter that we all got, the 114 groups that are asking for a massive reduction in the NYPD period to really rethink how we work in our communities, how we, how we re- um, uh, the letter is a beautiful letter, you should just read it, um, but how we rethink how we can really resource these organizations, the ones you talked about, the immigrant community organizations that have a robust and strong trustful relationship with communities. 
Um, and so I would like to hear from the NYPD about how we can engage that conversation since we are gonna be in budget negotiations. We are in that right now and how we can start creating a, a plan that works with community to reduce, massively reduce the NYPD uh, budget. And I'll leave you with those final questions. Sure, so uh, thanks council member for the question. So, uh, I mean, in terms of um, the case that you mentioned that you said you, you heard that somebody had filed a DV complaint and ICE came to their house. I mean, if you can share anything about uh, what that case is, I could look into the particular case I haven't heard of it. I, I can tell you in terms of what the PD policy is. And I know that you're aware because me and you have communicated many times about uh, immigrant issues is we don't share information, uh, particularly complainant witness information with ICE. Uh, there is very strict uh, protocols uh, that were passed in the privacy laws uh, by the council. We adhere to those strictly. Uh, I think the most telling is putting aside uh, victim or witness information, if you just simply look at individuals that are arrested and what our compliance rate is with uh, detainer requests, they're basically non-existent. So, and we're not even, in your example, you're not even talking about individuals arrested, you're talking about a complainant. So I, I wouldn't know how that could possibly happen. We certainly wouldn't be uh, turning that information over to any third parties. But if you have any more information about that particular case, you can call me offline and I could, uh, I could look into that particular case and see what may have happened. In uh, terms of, um, uh, am I still going or? Yeah, just, uh, answer the other question about massively yeah. reducing the budget and the 114 groups that just sent out a letter to the mayor, uh, to the speaker. Yeah, I'm, I'm not familiar with with the letter. I haven't read it. Uh, mm -hmm. So I'm certainly looking forward to reading it, but I. Look, I think um, it wouldn't surprise you if I tell you that uh, the NYPD budget is a necessary budget. I mean, to keep New York City safe, to keep uh, New York City at record crime lows, um, you need a police force that's a vibrant, dynamic police force, a uh, police force like the NYPD. Now, we certainly have uh, instituted a lot of programs, for example, neighborhood policing, I think that's in the vein that you were talking about. And more recently, um, the current police commissioner stood up our youth initiative is to inter intervene and engage with youth before they go on the wrong path and before they enter the criminal justice system. So uh, we are doing all of those things. I mean, I'm, I'm sure there's an, uh, a large number of programs that I'm sure you're aware of that we're doing. Um, some you may not be, but I'm certainly uh, willing to talk to you offline and give you a larger picture on that. But uh, the, the NYPD budget is a necessary budget. I mean, that's what keeps people in New York City safe. All right. I'm I would also like to add one thing that I think is really important. Again, I'm just serving the immigrant community because I do believe that they face additional barriers and we are working with our providers very much to get the word out there. Just in our time of doing the, the family justice centers virtually, we've serviced uh, clients from 45 countries in 23 different languages. So immigrant communities are coming forward and they are reaching out um, when it is safe to do so. So thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Councilmember Menchaca, and thank you to all the council members for your very thoughtful questions. Um, thank you, Chair Richards and Speaker Johnson. Really appreciate your insights and the issues that you are pushing. Um, I'm going to wrap it up with the administration just to say thank you so much for your time. We're now two and a half hours in, so thank you so much for all your time. I know you have important work to do. Um, but it goes without saying that I think we'd like to see more information about why on the NYPD side, why arrests, uh, complaints, um, why complaints and arrests are down. I think that could be a, an important topic of conversation to explore. And um, Commissioner Noel, you know, you're, you're doing your woman's job and I really appreciate all of that. Um, I guess I would ask, uh, you know, you know, for a, a, a much more robust um, messaging plan, um, much more robust and culturally competent 
messaging. It sounds like you have a phase two coming up. We look forward to hearing about that. Um, and we'll look forward to hearing about uh, what, how you're planning for, for how survivors will, what services will be available to, to survivors who are choosing to stay home at this point, um, but who will be merging, emerging as the pause is lifted. Um, but really appreciate all of your work. I also just want to again thank the ASL interpreters. I don't know if other people have been watching them. Um, they're extraordinary. Um, and I think we also have Spanish uh, interpretation going at this same time. So thank you all for your very hard work. And of course, thank you to the staff for keeping this going. I'm going to turn it back to my council who um, I think is going to start now with the advocate panel. Uh, thank everyone for their patience. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair Rosenthal. We will now turn to public testimony. I would like to remind everyone that unlike our typical council hearings, we'll be calling individuals one by one to testify. Council members who have questions for a particular panelist should raise their hand function in Zoom, and we will call on you after each panelist has completed their testimony. For panelists, once your name is called, a number of our staff will unmute you and the Sergeant at Arms will give you the go ahead to again upon setting the timer. Today, we will be using a three minute clock for testimony. Please wait for the Sergeant at Arms to announce that you may begin before delivering your testimony. So we will start with testimony of the first, three the first four panelists today. Again, one by one will be Ranam Tasnuva, followed by Nikki Seth or Niketa Seth, followed by Brian Dworkin, followed by Jai Young Kim. I will now call on Ranam Tasnuva. Time begins now. Good afternoon, distinguished member of city council. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. My name is Ranam Tasnova, and I'm the manager of our helpline program at Womankind, formerly New York Asian Women's Center. We are here today as a culturally specific gender-based violence organization with over three decades of experience to provide input on how our communities are navigating life during the COVID-19 pandemic. I will do this by highlighting our work through our community-based programming more specifically, our helpline and community-based counseling services. Our helpline has been instrumental in allowing us to stay connected to the Asian and immigrant communities. Formed back in 1982, our helpline continues to be at the front line, being the gateway for our community to accessing services. In operating a phone line, along now with the text and chat feature, we are able to be nimble and move more intentionally with the safety needs of our community. Just recently, I received a call from a client who I interacted with in Bengali. We were working together to plan a move out strategy for her existing home to our emergency residential home. At the beginning of the call, I was able to share our text line number as well as information regarding our chat service in the event the call gets disconnected. In the middle of that conversation, her abusive partner arrived while she was on the phone with me and she had to end up the call. Moments later, we were able to connect over text and continue our conversation safely. Having this alternative platform available to support the client at the moment is something we realize we need more than ever during this stay in place. As most of our survivors are living within an environment where abuse is also present, so the sense of emotional and physical safety is more difficult at this time. Being on a call with 911 operator may put our survivors at high risk to being caught by the abuser while they are seeking help. Having a text option along with the call may reduce that possibility. We have seen this being helpful while we were negotiating call with 911 operator on behalf of our survivors at the situation where they were unable to physically call themselves. 
our helpline is being present and available in so many languages put us also in a very unique position where we are able to support the culturally specific way. We, the Womankind community, thank the City Council for allowing us the opportunity to speak today. For survivors of gender-based violence, we have history. We have seen this. Should I continue or? Wrap it up. If you thank could just you. wrap it up quickly. So we are asking to continue all of you to commit to gender-based violence survivors and immigrant communities recognizing the multiple barriers this community is negotiated every day and the need for specialized support. In order, we ask for your financial commitment to ensuring organizations like ours who are deeply rooted for underserved communities are able to stay whole during and after the pandemic to able to provide critical service to New Yorkers. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Tesnuva. We may have a council member question. Council member Lansman, do you have a question? I do, thank you. Um, <clears throat> I just wanted to get um, your opinion on why you think the there might be um, this increase <clears throat> in domestic violence calls um, but fewer uh, arrests. Are you hearing from, are you seeing anything in the community that might give you some uh, um, reason to, to, to think that, or to understand why that is occurring? Um, because I, and I don't think my colleagues have gotten a really clear explanation from the, from the city. So I wanna hear what you're seeing on the ground. What we are seeing during our helpline calls are that um, survivors are calling helpline, um, but they are late in response from NYPD. Um, I also have experienced a um, similar uh, situation while I was on the phone with one of our survivors. She called multiple times when NYPD while she was actually being forcefully evicted by her abuser from the home. And she was literally on the street with her child she called 911 twice, no one showed up. And then I had to be on the phone with a 911 operator to help, uh, seek help for the uh, survivor. So um, I'm not gonna say that we are not seeing increase of helpline mm -hmm. calls or domestic violence calls, but mm -hmm. I do get um, feedback from survivors that there are delays in response. And are those delays um, uh, uh, different than, than the kind of delays and experiences they had before the coronavirus crisis? Um, I would say that I think, the, I, I think right now survivors' expectation also that they are not only dealing with the uh, domestic violence or the safety of their uh, physical well-being, but also like the health concern. So these two things are going together, and I think that's making them more um, more insecure at the moment. And uh, we do like to see that NYPD responds more faster because um, I think we haven't seen any change uh, in that. Uh, and one other question, if I can. Um, <clears throat> and, and the other providers who are gonna be testifying, um, if you could incorporate this maybe in your testimony, so I, I don't have to ask each of you uh, each time. But um, I had asked the city whether or not um, they thought it was a good practice, a good idea to affirmatively, proactively reach out to DV victims, people who they have interacted with, with before, to check in, see how they're doing, um, given that it seems like it is particularly difficult for a DV victim to reach out on his or her own um, while they're potentially cooped up with their abuser. And I don't think I'm mischaracterizing the city's response when I say that they thought that would not be a good idea and is not necessary. So again, I'd like to hear from you and, and the other witnesses, the ones who were like on the ground also dealing in some cases with your own particular communities and particular cultures. Do you think that it would be good 
for the city and for you to be reaching out affirmatively to um, uh, people who, with whom you have a, a, a history. Um, and, and if you do think that's a good idea, um, what do you think that the city should be doing? Thank you for your question. Um, again, um, I do think that it is um, important to have a check-in with the survivor, but I also do understand the safety concern that each survivor may have because of their inner situation. So um, I would not suggest to voluntarily go and do a check-in with someone because that might put them into more risk than they are at. So I think um, what we are doing in our agency with our helpline that uh, we are uh, providing messages out there that if anybody, if any of the previous victims is experiencing something new at this time, they should always reach out to us uh, via our phone number or our text line, chat line, but we would not uh, voluntarily go and uh, make a phone call to see how that person is doing because that may not be safe for them. Good. Well, that's why it's important for, for, for me to hear from, from the experts and the people who really uh, know this work. Thank you very much. Thank you, Council Thank Member Lanceman. Let's continue. Thank you, Ms. Tesnuba. Um, I will now move to the next panelist who is Nikki Sheth, also from Womankind. Thank you. Thank you to all the esteemed members, chairs, and administration who are on this call today. I just want us to take a step back. I know many of you have been on this call today um, hearing so much. Um, I want to ground us back to the survivor experience, especially survivors who are living in communities of color, who represent communities of color, and represent undocumented immigrant communities. If you could just take the next couple moments and imagine what it would feel like to be in the shoes of a survivor in this extraordinary time that we're in. I want you to imagine if you were a mother who just had a child, a premature baby at this time of COVID, and you are staying in an emergency house so that you can keep you and your two children safe. Imagine if you are a mother and you have a child, and you are in the process of trying to escape from an abusive family, leaving your belongings outside with the support of an organization like Womankind, yet you are caught by an adverse party. You are a survivor who is being forced by an abuser to engage in sexual activity and experiencing threats of contraception. You can't afford access to medical help. You are a survivor who is desperately needing food access to support you and your children, yet your abuser has taken control and powers to the next level and is holding on to all of the food stamps that you might have. And finally, you are a survivor who is sheltered in place with an abusive partner for some time, and you are in the process of a divorce. And unfortunately, due to courts being closed, you are simply in a holding pattern, enduring more anxiety and abuse. I'm grounding you with these experiences because I ask you to feel into the lives of these individuals. These individuals are real. These are our clients in the last few months and they are your constituents. These individuals need our help. I ask us all today to find a way to work together. I know it's difficult. There are many challenges ahead of us and I ask us to remember our survivors and make sure that each of your decisions and all of your actions really align with the passion that you're bringing on this call today. I also ask us to hold, our, hold ourselves accountable to all of our roles, including myself, the positions of privilege and the positions that bring us on this call today. Our survivors are relying on us. I'm Nikki Sheth and I'm a survivor and I'm the CEO of Womankind. Womankind for 38 years, formerly known as the, as the New York Asian Women's Center has helped countless Asian survivors and beyond. Our focus has been domestic violence, sexual violence, and human trafficking. We also help elders. I want you all to know that what we are seeing right now is unimaginable. Our helpline and chat, as you heard from Ranam, we are representing 18 different languages and dialects. Recently, as you heard, we our language capability has allowed us to help unique situations, such as an individual who was able to call and unfortunately needed to hang up 
And because of our chat feature, in combination with our translation ability and our cultural competency, was able to immediately call 911 on behalf of survivor. I wanna highlight that because there are going to be limitations that the city may not be able to fill the gap for. And that's why organizations like ours exist. It's really important that organizations like ours have your support. It's at times like this that undocumented immigrants- uh, You can finish, thank you. That the times like this and undocumented immigrants, such as 75% of who womankind serves are not being represented. And I ask you today to keep in mind what are often the core needs at this time. Our survivors are not just seeing violence. They're facing homelessness and starvation. They are undocumented immigrants who do not speak this language that we, we speak. And so therefore I ask you to think about the vast amount of needs that need to be thought about for domestic violence. And that's why today I ask that we really pay attention and we do everything we can. As city council members, you have, you have the ability to support us, to make sure that cuts are not made to discretionary funding. And so that, because cuts like that would really cause an equity issue across New York City and beyond. It would hurt small organizations and organizations supporting communities of color. At Womankind, 85% of our funding relies on government grants. And I just wanna be able to be back here and have Ron and be back here on a call months from now and not have to worry about the implications that it would have for us to keep doing our work. We hope that we can continue to collaborate with you on problems and solutions. And we hope that you would reach out informally if you'd like to learn more about what we know about the communities that we serve. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Sheff. We're going to call the next panelist. Um, and just a reminder, please wait for the sergeant to announce that you may begin before beginning your testimony um, as they set the clock. Thank you again. Our next witness is Brian Dworkin. Time starts now. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Brian Dworkin and I'm from Legal Services NYC from our Queens office. I supervise the domestic violence and family law practice my colleague Jay Young Kim from the Bronx office will also be testifying shortly. I thank you all for this opportunity to testify about the impact of coronavirus on DV and our clients here in New York City. We want to express our appreciation to the City Council for its continued support for the work of combating DV. Uh, the Dove program uh, supports 12 advocates at Legal Services NYC in whole or in part who provide direct services to clients. This public health emergency is directly and disproportionately impacting communities of color and not coincidentally, our clients are primarily immigrant survivors of color. Support for our program and for all of the Dove programs and for all of the other agencies that do this work really affirms the city's commitment to improving lives in these communities. Legal Services NYC advocates provide legal and core services to low-income families, families and individuals experiencing violence, and we serve survivors regardless of their immigration status. During this public health emergency, Hellas NYC continues to provide comprehensive legal and support services to individuals affected by DV. Although our physical offices were closed in March, our staff are working remotely on behalf of new and existing clients. All of our staff members are equipped to work remotely. We have full use of all of our electronic systems, files, and working phone systems. Our advocates are providing legal assistance and representation in the virtual NYC courts including obtaining new orders of protection, drafting emergency motions related to custody and visitation. We continue to provide advice to clients concerning custody and parenting issues that have arisen as a result of the public health emergency. This is probably the number one issue that's affecting our client population right now is how to negotiate custody and parenting time given, given the health situation that we're in, how to help parents work out compromises with each other, and how to help them assert their rights where the compromises are not possible. Uh, our advocates are also continuing to provide immigration assistance to survivors of domestic violence and trafficking. 
LSNYC also continues to engage in interdisciplinary clinic uh, client assessment and advocacy, makes in-house referrals to our housing program, our public benefits program, our education program, and other essential needs that arise for clients during this time. And Dove, Dove funding supports all of this work. LSNYC has been working with the state courts as they transition to virtual appearances for the emergency um, system. Advocates have been regularly facilitating virtual communication with the courts. We've been petitioning with the courts since the very first day that the virtual courts went into operation. Uh, the stress of the pandemic has escalated tension and violence due to limitations on the survivors' usual coping tactics and safety measures thereby increasing risk of harm within the homes that they live. To meet this need, we continue to accept referrals and conduct intake telephonically, including referrals from the Family Justice Centers citywide. Our advocates provide free and confidential legal assistance and ensure that all of our clients are aware of the constant changes within the civil and immigration legal systems. I just, if I can just take a moment and respond also to Councilman Lansman's question, um, we are reaching out to all of our current clients for whom we have established safe ways and reach to reach out to them if they are currently living in their abusive situations. Some of our clients also indicate to us they do not wish us to reach out, but that they will initiate contact when they need it. I'll break here. Thank you. And Councilmember Lansman, do you want to follow up on that? I do, thank you. Um, not so much on, on that, but uh, the committee that I chair uh, has jurisdiction over the courts um, for what that means at the city council level. Um, <clears throat> is there anything that you can tell us that we should try to be encouraging the, the courts to do differently as they are grappling with, with how to handle cases, how to do virtual and remote hearings, uh, mm -hmm. et cetera? Well, I, I mean, you know, we're in regular and frequent communication with the, the family courts and the Supreme Court. What they need is they need all the assistance they can toward increasing their capacity to function. They have got everything up and running and, you know, they, they started with emergency applications. Recently, they've expanded the uh, work that's happening in pending cases in the Supreme Court. So for example, some of our matrimonial cases can begin to move forward a little bit, but the operation is constrained by the technology right now. They're, you know, they're trying to get more and more court staff and, and jurists able to participate and be active, but they are constrained by the limits on the technology and on the limits of available people, because we know many court staff have been affected uh, by the virus and gotten sick and simply are not also available at this time to pitch in. For things that we cannot do right now that we are hoping that we get access to in the near future, for example, we can't file support petitions for clients now, and we can't file support modification petitions for clients who've lost jobs and might be in need of modification. We also cannot initiate uh, new non-emergency custody and visitation petitions at this time. So the, the scope of what's being heard is, you know, we know everybody's trying hard, it's just, it's just limited right now, and so we're all working within those constraints. Thank you. We have no other council member questions, and council member Lansman, are you finished? We'll move on to the next panelist. Um, and I'll list the next um, several panelists after this next panelist. Um, it, the next panelist will be Jai Young Kim. After that, we'll be the honorary Judy Harris Kluger, followed by Kelly Coyne, followed by Jai He Fisher and Amy Barash. So uh, Jai Young Kim, if you could please well, begin. Good afternoon, Chair Rosenthal, Chair Richards, and other council members. Um, my name is Jay Young Kim. I'm the director of the Family and Immigration Unit at um, the Bronx Office with Legal Services NYC. And I'm going to speak a little bit to Lizney's uh, COVID response and what we've done to shift resources to really assist 
our clients in the areas where we've seen sort of the greatest need. We have been um, <clears throat> increasing our peer technical assistance capacity and supporting our other colleagues in navigating the virtual courts and keeping up to date on issues within immigration court and with USCIS. We've also, some of the boroughs have started rapid response hotlines specifically to address these custody and visitation issues and order of protection issues. We've also established an emergency client fund targeting those who are particularly vulnerable and those are usually our undocumented clients who are not eligible for the stimulus relief or any form of unemployment or public assistance. And we've also been shifting resources to do public assistance application clinics to maximize the number of our clients who are eligible for public assistance. And um, we are you know, very proud of the fact that folks have really been shifting to, to meet the needs because we're really seeing those as sort of vulnerable areas. And I wanted to just share some client stories because We've been really busy at the office, even though we have shifted to virtual working from home, clients are still in need of services. We filed one of the first virtual um, family offense petitions on behalf of a healthcare worker who's being stalked by her abuser. And she knew that she was going to be going to work and she was deeply afraid because there was a long history of physical violence. And she knew she needed the order of protection for safety purposes. And it was really great to actually work in conjunction with the courts to file that order of protection. And we were successful in getting that tempor or temporary order of protection. And you know we continue to have issues around custody and visitation. For example, we've just recently filed in our Bronx office um, on behalf of a survivor that was assaulted by her abuser at visitation exchange. And um, we'll also probably be seeking a modification of the custody and visitation order. And we're really seeing how abusers are using pause orders, are using COVID-19 as a way to withhold uh, contact with children. And you know, this is true whether our clients have physical custody of the children or whether they're the visiting parent, but that's unacceptable. And it's it's been very difficult because we are doing the best that we can. And the courts, again, as my colleague Brian had mentioned, are constrained, but we're hoping to continue to advocate on behalf of our clients. And as well with the immigration clients, we continue to screen people because they need to be able to get work authorization, get eligibility for public benefits. And oftentimes our clients are either the sole provider of their family or they have no support networks in part because the abuser created a situation where they were isolated. So even if we have clients who are able to leave the abuser and have some modicum of relief, they really are relying on the immigration cases still going forward and having advocates pushing to get work authorizations and ensuring that they get the documentation to prove their eligibility for public assistance. And so I would just strongly urge, you know, we are deeply concerned about the safety of our clients at this time. And we believe that our work is definitely essential and we need the funding to continue to do that work because without it, we cannot support these clients who are immediately in crisis. Thank you very much. I don't believe we have any council member questions. And so we will move to the next witness. Judge Kluger from Sanctuary for Families. Um, please begin once the sergeant has started Time the clock. Begins now. Good afternoon. Um, I am really grateful for the opportunity to testify today and thank the council uh, in particular, Chair Helen Rosenthal for its leadership in addressing the dire situations facing domestic violence survivors during these unprecedented times. Long before New York City's first, uh, am I being heard? Yes, thank oh, you. I got a um, notice. Long before New York City's first COVID-19 case, we were battling another public health crisis high rates of domestic violence and sex trafficking that disproportionately harmed already marginalized communities. The grave dangers faced by victims quarantined with abusers are compounded to, for those communities facing disproportionate layoffs, 
racism, xenophobia, and harsh federal policies. While Sanctuary's website traffic has more than doubled in the past month, lower hotline numbers may actually be a troubling evidence that victims have fewer safe moments to place calls. There is a wide recognition that there will be a spike in domestic violence in the months ahead. And essential service providers like Sanctuary must be prepared, including assurance from the city that our funding will be kept whole. We are seeing evidence that abuse is escalating in frequency and severity, both for those living with abusers as well as those who are not. We're observing increased harassment via cyber abuse, via text, email, and social media. Clients are facing complex legal issues with deep uncertainty about how or when they can be addressed given mm -hmm. the modified court operations. One client was told by her abuser, she better watch her back because the courts are closed, so don't do anything. This comment, this comment highlights the communication challenges that I will address shortly. We have seen the city take many positive steps in response to this crisis, but have several key concerns and recommendations. At the top of the list is improving communication about victim resources to the most vulnerable of us. The city can utilize its Notify NYC emails, texts, social media alerts to publicize domestic violence resources, including the phone contacts for the family justice centers and sanctuaries legal and clinical helplines as well as our newly launched tech chat, text chat numbers. The city can also display this information on Wi-Fi kiosks, bus stops, and subway display screens. We are grateful to the council speaker and members who have already pushed out some of this information, but the city can do much more to get the information to people in need and counteract the flood of misinformation that is spread by abusers and on social media. We're very grateful for our partners at the mayor's office to end gender-based violence, who got the uh, family justice centers running up and running quickly. But we know that there are many people out there who s are still not accessing services or not getting the help they need when they um. do try and reach out. While recognizing the extraordinary strains and heroic sacrifices on the part of the NYPD and emergency services, Right now, we have concerns about police response to abuse during this crisis. Multiple sanctuary clients have reported issues with police informants, ranging from refusal to serve and enforce orders of protection and failure to arrest abusers who violate existing orders. There are several examples in my testimony, uh, my submitted testimony, but I want to highlight two. One client, after managing to obtain an exclusionary order of protection, contacted two police precincts. Both told her that they could not enforce the order unless she had a hard copy. Of course, she had only received the order by email because the courts were closed. Only late night calls from a sanctuary lawyer, only after late night calls by one of our lawyers did they agree to help. What might have happened if there had been no lawyer advocating strenuously for action by the police? When another abuser's, when another client's abuser came to her apartment in violation of a five-year order of protection, responding officers told him to leave, but declined to arrest him for criminal contempt, a mandatory arrest situation. We welcome the opportunity to speak with NYPD to ensure that what we hope are isolated incidents do not happen again. On the service delivery side, I am pleased to report that Sanctuary has pivoted to continuing providing all our, all our services that we have for years. Our shelters remain open, they're at capacity. We have new intakes. Sanctuary lawyers are staffing the legal helpline, so callers always receive a live answer. Our clinical program is providing counseling and case management by, via a secure telehealth platform. And our economic empowerment program purchased and hand-delivered laptops to um, our clients at home. And our survivor leaders and staff have published safety plans, flyers, know your rights information in many languages and broadcast it widely on social media to city officials and other service providers. It is only a matter of time before we see a wave of new domestic violence cases. And the level of need among existing clients will only deepen in the difficult months ahead. 
Human service providers like Sanctuary and our community partners must be prepared to respond. We need city officials and law enforcement to work with us to ensure that abuse survivors know that their lives count, that their desperate situations are worthy of timely, compassionate, and professional interventions. Thank you so much. We have, thank you so much, Judge Cooper. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't, I, we have several. I didn't mean not to have the video on. I guess that was the message. We can see you. Thank you. Uh, Chair Rosenthal, did you have questions? Uh, with yeah, the just real quickly, um, Judge Kluger, you're always the wise voice. I really appreciate your um, testimony, which just gets right to the point, and we will read your submitted testimony as well. I think the obvious question is the two cases that you um, mentioned that have to do with police interaction, do you think it would be worthwhile um, for us to communicate the date, uh, time, and location of those interactions so the um, deputy inspector can go back and look at the body camera? Absolutely. Uh, and I will... Um... Okay be in touch with the lawyers who were involved in that case, uh, those cases, and, and get the information. Thank you very much. And there are a few others in my written testimony as well. I think, um, you know, thank you for bringing those forward, and, and we will follow up with them about that. Really appreciate your insights. Thank you. Moving to Chair, or sorry, excuse me, moving to Councilmember Lansman next for questions. Thank you. Um, Judge, it's good to see you. Uh, good to see you too. Could you maybe give us a little more depth um, where you said that the city can do much more to get the word out, um, to alert uh, people as to um, uh, the services and resources that might be uh, available to them. And, and then in particular, I don't know if you, you were referring to this, um, but um, whether or not the, the messaging that you do see coming from the city is, is fitting the time that we're in, or are they just kind of cookie cutter messages from, from a pre-COVID era that, that should be, should be fine-tuned? What, what more and different can the city be doing? Well, I think the message has to be that despite shelter in place. There are phone numbers that they can call, Family Justice Center, call us directly, the Safe Horizon hotline. I think it has to be targeted to the fact that people are at home, they're often with their abuser in the home, and they have to know that there is a way to virtually get help. And um, I'm not even sure what kind of signage is, are on the courts now. Um, I mean, hopefully they're in multiple languages because there are some people who might go to family court and then not know what to do or who to call. Uh, also to my colleague who talked about uh, opening more the courts for more applications, particularly in family court around uh, custody and visitation and support. I think the plan is to get that going, but I have a visitation example in my, um, uh, in my written testimony that uh, shows that there really needs to be attention to the fact that there could be uh, clients who have, uh, whose abusers, the father of their children have visitation, but the child has asthma. They don't wanna take the child on the train uh, and they're ordered to do so by the court. So there has to be some availability other than by order to show cause, which is the only way available now for a, a victim to go and speak to a judge about visitation uh, modifications. And, um, you know, we interact with OCA and, and, and you know that world uh, better than I do. Um, would you say that the lines of communication are, are, are open? And, and I know that yes. the system is trying to grapple with, with, with going from, from zero to, to 60 at, at the, you know, in, in, in just one, one, one second. Um, things are opening up in kind of a sequential way and in, in some effort to, to, to try to triage and prioritize certain kinds of proceedings. Um, but could, can you just tell us like what, what conversations there are with, with OCA to make sure that, that these issues that you're, you're raising are, are gotten to? 
Yeah, the lines of communication are very strong. Um, we have many of us on the phone and other service providers have regular calls with the family court administrative judges. We've had contact with Judge Marks. I know Judge DeFiori is committed to getting the courts open as soon as possible. I think like many organizations that were not ready technologically to do this, and I understand the city council had some um, challenges as well. Uh, I think that uh, it's a hard time for everybody, but I, the, the lines of communication are open and we, um, we're having another call next week with Judge Ruiz to uh, talk about suggestions and what we think can be done better, what's being done well, uh, what kind of changes can be made. Uh, we, we've had that positive experience also, in, including in yeah. particular with, the, with Judge Ruiz. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. We do not have any other council member questions, so we'll move to the next witness. Our next witness is Kelly Coyne from Safe Horizon. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Oh, I want to thank you for uh, the opportunity to um, talk with you all today, and a, a specific thanks to Chair Rosenthal and Richards. My name is Kelly Coyne, and I'm the Deputy Chief Program Officer at Safe Horizon, the nation's largest nonprofit victim services organization. At Safe Horizon, we offer a client-centered, trauma-informed response to a quarter of a million New Yorkers each year who've experienced violence and abuse. I'd like to offer a general overview of how Safe Horizon is operating during this pandemic and a couple of reflections about how the city and city council can help engage New Yorkers who might be at risk of domestic violence and who might think there's no options to seek safety during this time. Um, one thing to note is normally Safe Horizon has a thousand employees working in over 200 locations across the city. Um, since the pause has gone into effect, many of Safe Horizon staff are now working remotely as their program sites have physically closed. For example, the advocates who typically sit in all 86 police precincts in the police service areas are now reaching out via telephone to New Yorkers who file police reports related to domestic violence, assault, and other crimes. Similarly, our staff who normally sit in the five family justice centers are continuing to offer, offer safety assessments and safety planning and resources to clients over the phone. Some of our programs are also essential and are still operating in, in person. All eight of our domestic violence shelters remain open. Our five child advocacy centers remain open. Our street work project is continuing to respond to homeless youth um, who are in need of shelter or drop-in services. And our hotline is working both remotely and in person. A couple of recommendations during this uh, great time of uncertainty and fear is I think that we really want to offer the following uh, words to all New Yorkers who might be feeling unsafe right now, and that's we are open. Um, while some programs and sites are physically closed, Safe Horizon staff and many, many of our community partners are still reaching out and supporting victims of crime each and every day, offering our services either by phone, Skype, Zoom, other virtual platforms, and then in person in our physical locations. Um, we're still offering evidence-based mental health counseling to survivors over the phone. We're helping victims obtain order of protection through virtual, virtual courts. And our web-based um, chat line, Safe Chat, is offering a more private way for New Yorkers to reach out for help. Um, to further um, the points is we're working, we're also working closely with 110 of the organizations fundled, funded through the City Council's Dove Initiative to make sure appropriate services are available to New York's diverse cultural communities. Understanding the heightened fear in immigrant communities, especially during this health crisis, we are proud to partner with those leading domestic violence organizations funded through Dove that specialize in responding to New, York, New Yorkers no matter where they were born. The Dove Initiative has always been important, but in this uh -huh. environment, at this moment in our history, it's literally a lifesaver for New Yorkers in every neighborhood. I want to ask the city council to remember these vulnerable families as we go into what's definitely going to be an austere budget for FY21. Um, we hope that we keep these vulnerable families and victims close to your heart as you uh, enter what is obviously going to be a complicated budget negotiation for this year. Thank you all so much for this time and I'm happy to respond to any questions that you might have. Thank you, Ms. Coyne. We do not have any council member questions at this time, but we're going to pause for just a moment.
um, to switch out captioners if um, we can please wait. Um, I think it's worth, uh, I just need to correct for the record, we don't have Spanish translation going at this hearing. We do have CART and ASL for um, the hard of hearing and the deaf population. Okay, if you're um, watching the hearing, we are ending our pause and we will be moving to the next witness. So our next two witnesses, I will call you one at a time, are Jahi Fisher and Amy Barash. Jahi Fisher, uh, as soon as the sergeant starts the clock, you may begin your testimony. Thank you. You can start. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you for the um, opportunity um, to testify um, this afternoon. I would like to um, thank Speaker Johnson, Chair Rosenthal, and Chair Richard um, for, for um, uh, coordinating this um, budget hearing. Um, the Korean, um, my name is Jihae Fisher. Um, the executive director at the Korean American Family Service Center. Uh, we provide services including 24 hour hotline, shelter, long term transitional housing, in economic empowerment programs to immigrant um, survivors um, of domestic violence, sexual assault, and child abuse. We're committed to preventing and ending domestic violence sexual assault and relationship abuse and creating a violence-free um, society. KFSC is the only organization serving Korean immigrant families who are affected by domestic violence, sexual assault, trafficking, and child abuse in the tri-state area with an emphasis on the highest Korean populated areas in the borough of Queens and Manhattan, New York City. 90% of our um, clients are Asian immigrants, 95% are women, and 98% have um, limited English proficiency, 98% of our clients live under the poverty line. Our population is disproportionately at risk and left without a safety net in the wake of this global um, pandemic. As a direct service organization serving the vulnerable immigrant community, we are an essential human service provider that cannot cease operating. KFSC continues to still be fully open to the Korean community. And we have stepped it into the role of providing um, services that have not normally been our target area. Um, KFSC continues to provide crisis intervention and COVID-19 related services to our community for small business loans, emergency fund applications, public benefits, health insurance enro enrollment, and more through both in-person virtual appointments. I just want to point out that what we're because of the population that we're serving, we um, made a decision to uh, be physically open. Our um, um, serving population is um, elder immigrant survivors who have a very difficult time navigating um, virtual world, um, especially with the technologies. So it was very important for us to be open physically and still take intake, um, um, in-person intake. Um, our staff members are provided with um, protective gear. Um, 
and um, clients are clients are um, screened very carefully. Um, our survivors are faced with inconceivable challenges during this um, ch difficult time. Many are undocumented and work hourly um, at local restaurants, living paycheck to paycheck. So enforcement of social distancing and other safety measures mean that our survivors and their children are trapped at home and face additional violence and challenges. Financial difficulties uh, compounded with social isolation um, heightened uh, existing abusive relationship. In fact, we're experiencing a 300% increase in calls at our bilingual 24 hotline in the last five weeks uh, with 80% related to domestic violence, sexual assault and child abuse. Um, so as we, we ask all of you to please continue to support um, our, um, our services and programs um, to this vulnerable community. And more than ever, our immigrant survivors are needed uh, for our services. Um, therefore, uh, we, we ask you to continue provide, especially for the um, upcoming fiscal year um, discretionary funding. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. We do not have any council member questions and we'll be moving to the next witness. Before our next witness, um, which will be Amy Barash, I'm going, to, I'm going to list the next three. We have Margarita Guzman from the Violence Intervention Program, BIP, Tauji Lorna Zen from NILAG, and Melina Sifalakinaki, excuse any um, selling from Legal Aid. So Amy Barash, um, once the Sergeant starts the clock, you may begin your testimony. Good afternoon. Thank you, Speaker Johnson, Chair Rosenthal, the Committee on Women and Gender Equity, Chair Richards, the Committee on Public Safety, and other members of the Council for inviting me to testify today. I'm Amy Barish, the Executive Director of Her Justice, a nonprofit that stands with women living in poverty in New York City. My pronouns are she, her, hers. In 2019 alone, Her Justice provided a range of legal help to more than 4,000 women and their 5,000 children in the areas of family, divorce, and immigration law. We provide free legal services in a unique pro bono first way. Our legal department of 21 lawyers and non-lawyers enable hundreds of private attorneys from across the city to deliver more than $41 million worth of legal services in every year. Our clients live in all five boroughs of the city, more than half are foreign born, and most are mothers who are or become the heads of their households. More than 75% of our clients are victims of domestic violence. During the COVID-19 crisis, our unique pro bono model has allowed us to pivot quickly and smoothly to provide services remotely, leveraging private volunteerism to prepare victims of domestic violence to engage with the courts now and once they reopen more fully and to keep work moving forward for ongoing cases of all kinds. Our civil legal services are always essential services, preventing greater crises down the road for women living in poverty. Civil court is critical for those victims and survivors who do not wish to call the police and or need to address issues regarding custody, visitation, and financial support. For us, that work is continuing during this pandemic and is more essential than ever. Most of our clients come to us through referrals from the courts, the FJCs, and our colleagues. All of these systems are still up and running, as is our telephonic helpline. Uh, I wanted to give three brief examples about what we're doing now as attorneys. There's more information in my submitted written testimony. I wanted to say that first of all, um, as people have talked about, many of our clients are sheltering in place with abusers. Typically about two thirds of our time is spent handling existing cases, not on new cases. And we're spending even more time with those clients right now. So for example, we have a client who is an immigrant victim of partner violence who lives in a building uh, in which her husband works. She has been able to text her volunteer attorneys when her husband goes upstairs to work in the building so that her immigration case continues to move forward. And once the, um, the pandemic restrictions are lifted, we anticipate that she will have her green card. I also wanna point out that although we do have many clients who are victims sheltering in place, many of our clients had already left their abusers but still face violence now. Like a client who wants a divorce and was delivering food to her mother who was sheltering in place only to be assaulted by her husband in the hallway in front of their seven-year-old daughter who tried to intervene. That client already had an order of protection. She called the police as she did the last time she was assaulted. 
Many abusers are stopped neither by the pause order right. nor by a court order. Since her husband had fled before, they issued a second warrant for his arrest. And for her, we are preparing all of her divorce documents. So the minute the courts open, we can file and get her on a path to meaningful separation and safety. And finally, I just want to echo the fact that the COVID crisis has become a new tool used by abusers to manipulate partners, particularly in the areas of custody and visitation. We had a client who had fled to New York City from Clinton County, New York, to avoid her abusive husband. They had a visitation exchange, but then when COVID broke out in New York City, the husband refused to return the child to the cities, insisting that the low numbers of COVID in Clinton meant that it was safe there and it was not safe in New York. After many weeks of negotiation, we were finally able to file an emergency petition through the courts and the judge saw through this, this um, position on the part of the husband and did return the child to our client who hadn't seen her child for over uh, four weeks. And I should just note there was no evidence that the father had been uh, social distancing himself. In fact, he'd been going out socializing, working with others and taking no public safety measures during the month that he had custody of the child upstate. So in short, I would just want to reiterate that the vital financial support we received from city council for which we are extremely grateful, helps us provide direct representation, advice and skilled advocacy in the civil courts that are often thought of second to the criminal system, but are equally vital to victims of domestic violence in the city. The public health crisis has highlighted the cracks that already existed in that civil justice system. And we appreciate the council's support and recognition of the legal services that are essential to help fill those cracks and give partners, victims of, of uh, violence, a path to safety. Thank you so much for your time. We have one question from Council Member Lanceman. Council Member? So um, you mentioned cracks in the, the court system and you, you, you got my attention. So what are some of those cracks? Uh, the highlights and how can we help fill them? Uh, thank you, council member. I think, um, you know, there has always been a, a deficit of available attorneys for litigants in the civil court. So that's just number one. Uh, and the council goes a long way to making that more um, plentiful. So we thank you for that. I think right now, you know, we too, as Judge Kluger said, we have been in constant communication with the courts. And I do appreciate that for all of this, pivoting to a virtual reality is extremely difficult. I will say that um, echoing one of my colleagues earlier, I would encourage the courts to be thinking as much as they can about virtual filing, e-filing. Even if a case can't proceed right now in cases like um, support matters or divorce matters, if we can get a date, a register a date for the filing of the case, that's very relevant to certain financial decisions that are made later on. Um, we also would love to see more information for the general public about what the courts are or are not doing. We're constantly sending memos around among ourselves and the courts have been very available to um, not-for-profits and to, to attorneys, which is terrific. Um, but if there were a way for the courts and perhaps in, in coordination with the city to publish more of that information, it would relieve a burden from us in disseminating that information so we could do more direct representation for our clients. I can't tell you how much time we spend both with volunteer attorneys and clients trying to explain what is or isn't available within the court system now. And again, appreciating that it's a challenging time for them. You know, I think we've heard a theme here that communication is really essential. So anything we can do to get that information out to the general public would be uh, helpful. Okay, thank you so much, um, council member. And thank you, Ms. Barish for your um, testimony. Well, next, oh, sorry, council member Lansman. <laughs> you're on, I think you're on mute council member. Thanks. Um, so, uh, you know, it's very hard often for, for OCA to translate its, its memos into, uh, into lay terms. So I don't, I, don't, I don't know how optimistic I am about that. Um, I, they just came out with an order today, uh, or maybe it was late last night on um, uh, electronic motion practice, which you know, took me a few minutes to, to decipher. But let me ask you substantively, the council has spent a tremendous amount of money on civil legal services in the housing arena, justifiably, and I'm fully supportive of that. Very briefly, do you anticipate um, a need for lawyers uh, who are available to, 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 to people without resources in different substance uh, su su uh, subject areas that relate to, to, to DV, aside from housing? Absolutely. We expect to see um, 
a huge surge in cases in the family courts and in the matrimonial supreme parts. Uh, some of those are cl clients we already have identified. So if they're filing for divorce, we are taking this pause moment to prepare all the paperwork so that they can file immediately once the courts become available for that. We have a huge backlog in people who need to file for child support. You can imagine people are losing jobs, are desperately in need of income, and we're unable to file for those cases right now. Um, and then there are a lot of pending matters where there's information we may not be getting. We've been very creative in reaching clients through virtual means. Many of our clients text. We've even been able to reach out to some through social media channels if that's safe. But there are always the clients you can't get to that you're worried about. We expect to hear from them once the restrictions are lifted with modifications to existing orders needed. So absolutely, I think that we are going to have not only our client base now that will need more help once the restrictions are lifted, but there will be more clients coming forward in the family and matrimonial parts. All right, thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. We will move to the next witness. Ms. Guzman from VIP. Once the Sergeant starts the clock, you may begin your testimony. You can start. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, Speaker Johnson, Chairs Rosenthal and Richards, and esteemed members of the Committees on Gender, on Women and Gender Equity and Public Safety. I thank you for creating this opportunity to come before for you today to share our insight about one of the most hidden and dangerous byproducts of the COVID pandemic, the increase in severity and frequency of domestic violence. Normally, I would begin by introducing myself and my organization, but I would like to begin not with my name, but the name of Tanya Gonzalo. I say her name so that everybody listening can lift her spirit and do justice to her memory. Almost two weeks ago on Sunday, April 19th, Tanya Gonzalo was found unconscious and unresponsive inside her apartment on East 105th Street in East Harlem. Police had just responded to a 911 call about a dispute she was having with her partner. She had been strangled to death and she was 48 years old. My name is Margarita Guzman. You can use she, her, they, or Margarita. I am the executive director of the Violence Intervention Program, VIP. VIP is the only culturally specific nonprofit in, in New York City serving Latina, Latino, and Latinx survivors of domestic and sexual violence, the vast majority of whom are low-income immigrants. VIP never went on pause. Our 24-hour hotline, our online chat service, emergency shelter, and transitional housing have remained fully operational. Our community-based staff immediately pivoted to a remote service model that is now more in contact with clients than before COVID, providing the strongest network of support possible. But these services are in jeopardy. The survivors we may have helped along with all of their children are in danger of going unseen, unheard and unserved. And the problem is not a lack of dedicated workers or a lack of expertise. It's not even because Latinas and immigrant women are hard to reach because we can and we do reach them with great success. It is the threat of losing discretionary funding if not all of our services are considered essential. The program most at risk is some of the most important and necessary work for any domestic violence provider, a strategic and culturally relevant outreach team. This couldn't be happening at a worst possible time. When Hurricane Katrina hit in 2005, a study was conducted on the incident and impact of intimate partner violence related to the disaster. It was the first population-based study that had ever documented the prevalence of IPV in a region before and after a major disaster. And it found that there was a 35% increase in the prevalence of psychological victimization of women and a 98% increase in physical victimization for women. It also concluded, the findings of this study have important implications for intervention efforts following large-scale disasters. First, the findings suggest that information um, about IPV resources should be disseminated to affected populations so that women and men who experience IPV for the first time following a disaster will know where to turn for help and information. Similarly, shelters, hotlines, and other existing resources should be appropriately staffed to handle a potential influx of inquiries. Every single person testifying before you today and so many more who cannot do so are speaking with one voice and delivering one message. 
There is a slowly simmering crisis of domestic violence happening in the city right now. And it's a public health issue that predated COVID-19 by centuries, but that is being intensified by this pandemic. And it would be so very wise to increase investments to these providers. Please reference the research on this issue, which I've included in the written testimony I submitted. In addition, there's an extraordinary article in the Washington Post today about the incidents of child abuse that also cross-references about um, pieces about the increased domestic violence. And we cannot turn our backs on these families now. I don't know if VIP's outreach would have ever reached Tanya Gonzalo, but last year alone, we reached over 10,300 community members in low-income Latinx immigrant neighborhoods with messaging specifically tailored to them. And in those thousands, we have reached so many more people in Tanya's situation, people whose lives have been saved, people that were never gonna call NYPD, but we can't save any lives if we can't tell them we're here to help them and if our workforce is decimated because of cuts to funding. I'm here to ask you to fulfill the city's commitment to those lives and the safety of some of New York's poorest and most vulnerable communities. We look forward to working with this esteemed body and the, and the city to continue to reach out to all the people trapped in abusive homes. Thank you for providing me the opportunity to testify and I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. Um, Maria, thank you for all the good work VIP does. You're an extraordinary advocate uh, for, um, for your clients and for so many others who would otherwise be unseen you know, it's hard to think specifically about Tanya, but for the people who were not necessarily reaching, is there, what's the next step up of what the city could be doing? Is it more messaging, which is what has been the theme here? Um, was Tanya on anyone's radar? I don't know the history between Tanya and any of the institutions that she may have interacted with. I know that she had not interacted with VIP, um, but I don't know if she had ever called out to the police before. You know, what's interesting is I know that uh, in a lot of sister organizations and at the city at large, we're seeing a reduction in calls to providers. That's not true at VIP. We've seen a, an increase in calls to our hotline last week, the week from April 19th to the 25th. Um, we had about a 40% increase in calls in that single week. Wow. We don't run a huge hotline. We maybe get somewhere between 125 to 140 calls a week. But last week we got over 200. So we know, um, and we are still conducting our outreach. We're still out there. Um, we have been doing a series of PSAs in Spanish language, um, and we are looking to get those interpreted in um, indigenous languages that our clients may speak. Um, so that we are getting messages out there in every way that we can. The messaging um, theme that you're hearing is a critical one, absolutely. But I also think that to make sure that it's effective, that it's heard, and that it gets to the communities you need it to get to, you need to partner with the smaller culturally specific organizations. Yeah. VAP is one of them, Saki for South Asian Women, Womankind, South Tietu Center for African Women and Children, Korean American Family Service Center, Arab American Family Support Center, just to name a few. Um, who are in community in ways and trusted and strong bridges. You know, people don't have a bridge to cross. They're not, not going to go anywhere. So we, we hope that we can partner by being those bridges. Thank you so much uh, for all of your work, Margarita. Thank you. Thank you for your work, Chair Rosenthal. Thank you. We will move to the next witness. Our next witness is Tauji Lorna Zen from Nyleg. Hi. Good afternoon. Thank you, Chair Richards, Chair Rosenthal, and council members for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Twazi Lorna Zen, and I am a supervising attorney at the New York Legal Assistance Group's Domestic Violence Law Center. Our Domestic Violence Law Center uh, staff speaks over 10 languages, including Spanish, Mandarin, Russian, Bengali, and Urdu, and provides free, comprehensive, and culturally competent family, matrimonial, appellate, and immigration representation to domestic violence survivors in this city. As the committees have already heard, there is a dangerous concern that during this pandemic, our city is experiencing an increase in domestic violence, coupled with declining access to services for survivors. 
the few resources that have been available during the pandemic substantially disadvantage those living in poverty and those with limited English capacity. Like many other provider agencies, we have seen a drop in calls that reflects the new challenges domestic violence survivors face during this time. Growing isolation, which obstructs the survivor's ability to seek help, lack of knowledge of what services remain open and available, and financial instability, making survivors dependent on abusers and impacting their ability to access remote or virtual services. In recognition of the dual public health crises of COVID-19 and domestic violence, our city can and must guarantee continued and even increased funding so that we are able to provide essential services to survivors through critical programs such as the Dove Initiative. In the past few weeks, NILAC has pivoted to respond to the needs of New Yorkers, including survivors of domestic violence. NILAC launched and is staffing a COVID hotline and our domestic violence law unit attorneys continued to virtually staff the family justice centers while increasing our immigration work as that work is imperative to our clients' financial security. We started to translate Know Your Right materials into multiple languages so that resource information is accessible to everyone and began implementing new systems and partnerships to adeptly respond to the expected rush of individuals in need of legal assistance when our city begins to reopen gradually. During the pandemic, the Domestic Violence Law Unit also partnered with organizations like Safe Horizon to assist survivors who are coming forward to draft, file, and appear virtually in family court to seek orders of protection. Just last week, we successfully helped seven survivors file for and obtain their first orders of protection. And our work confirms what we already believe, that being stuck at home is placing survivors at greater risk of harm while preventing them from being able to seek help. Take, for example, our client, Tina, who was repeatedly sexually assaulted by her husband, but had to carefully coordinate conversations through a code word as her husband was home after being laid off. Without funding, we could not pivot to do this work and meet Fine. our current demands while continuing with regular cases. And without continued funding, we will not be able to meet the anticipated surge that will come next when survivors have more freedom and ability to leave their homes and seek help. We believe that it is vitally important, particularly for trauma survivors, to have one attorney or one agency with whom they can develop a strong, trusting relationship to respond to their many intersecting legal needs. NILAG has and will continue to prepare to respond to the long-term domestic violence crisis that will come after this immediate health emergency ends. When this pause order is lifted and the surge in reporting that inevitably will come, comes, we must be available with appropriate funding to meet this anticipated demand, or we risk sending survivors back into the arms of their abusers. Thank you, and I welcome any questions. Thank you for your testimony. We do not have any council member questions. I will name the next, before I name the next witness, I'm going to read the next several witnesses. So after Melina Safakanaki from Lead, we'll have Julie Taylor from CCI, Nathaniel Fields from URI, Alyssa Keel from New Destiny Housing, and Sylvia Morse from SCO. So our next witness is Melina Safakanaki. Uh, when the sergeant announces that you may begin, please begin with your testimony. Thank you. Time starts now. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for the opportunity to testify here today. And then a special thank you to all of you that have lasted so long into this very lengthy meeting and are still attuned. The Legal Aid Society is the nation's oldest and largest provider of legal services to indigent clients. Across the society, our civil, criminal, and juvenile rights divisions serve over 300,000 individual matters each year. The Family Domestic Violence Unit of the Legal Aid Society represents hundreds of survivors of domestic violence and human trafficking in both family and Supreme Court annually. The attorneys of our unit provide full representation in complex and adversarial contested divorces covering all issues for survivors, including their rights to be free from harm in their own home with orders of protection, their rights to custody of their children, to child support, spousal maintenance, and equitable division of property, including the right to continue to occupy their homes and apartments, maintain their leases and other benefits while divorcing from their abusers. In family court, we also represent survivors of family 
in family offense matters to obtain orders of protection, custody, visitation, and support matters. We also represent eligible persons to obtain uncontested divorces without needing to appear in court. Citywide, we receive telephone intake from the public, referrals from the family justice centers, from other legal services agencies, and from our community PACE partners that are an integral part of what we do. And I just want to echo what Ms. Guzman said earlier. We are coming here to, to speak to you, all of us across the agencies, whether legal or direct services or emergency service providers in one voice, because we all feel the same needs and we all feel the same empathy towards our clients. In some of our neighborhoods, we also conduct walk-in intake as well. We are now working remotely since our offices have been closed during this class crisis. We are all equipped with internet access and society provided cell phones whereby we can text and email our clients as whatever means is more safe for them. Since the start of the crisis, we've witnessed drastic changes in the intake that we're receiving and our ability to serve our clients. Um, in the first instance, um, we are getting more calls but they are oftentimes just calls for advice, not for people in immediate crisis that are looking for shelter or for police intervention. There are calls sometimes from people who have been wanting to get divorced, didn't have time in the past to do the research and have the conversations, were overwhelmed with just subsiding their ordinary life. Now they've come out and asked for information Hi. and consider their options. We also get calls from people who already have existing orders of support and are now in fear of losing that support because the person providing support is jobless or unable to work or in quarantine or ill because of the virus and they stand to lose their shelter and their ability to care for their children. And there are also calls from people who are struggling with visitation and custody existing orders that they cannot reconcile on their own and we are limited in helping these people because we don't have enough access to the courts right now. We're responding, we're calling everybody back, but we cannot provide legal services while the courts are closed to everything but emergency matters. We are, cannot commence divorces now, we cannot start new support petitions, we cannot make new applications or adjust custody and visitations. We are not helping some of the most vulnerable. So we look to you in these situations to help us to get the courts moving again, to assist us in serving our clients. Um, in addition, we see the technology gap that is existing. Our client community includes people with multiple family members at home during the crisis, but with limited access to technology. Those without smartphones and internet service are not able to search the web for, search, for services or to make calls, even if just for advice. Also, people are without privacy. There are many family members sharing technology. When clients reach out for help, for domestic abuse issues, they need to reveal very personal and private and sometimes traumatizing details in their lives. They cannot do this in small apartments with their children and other family members in the same space. And they cannot go outside right now. Lack of technology is critical here. In that same way, we're looking that we can get technology out there the same way that the public school remote learning initiative got tablets and internet service to children. Similarly, every household should have access to phone communication. Once upon a time, there were landlines. They were considered a basic necessity for a household. Today, every person should have the right to access to a personal cell phone where they can have private and safe communications while they are with others in the same home. And we ask you once again to help us, to help the courts ease into more active functioning, to allow us to file these support petitions in whatever way possible to preserve, preserve that initiation date, to allow us to negotiate with our clients in front of a, a, a judge their inability to perform their custody and visitation responsibilities. And as always, 
there are clerical matters that could be going on in the courts right now that do not require the full opening of the court system. We have many, many filed divorces waiting for an official signature at the end, waiting to be filed in the clerk's office. Clearing such matters would allow our clients who have survived abuse and survived the court system to truly begin the next stage of their lives with dignity and autonomy that they have earned. I thank you for this opportunity. I echo what many of my colleagues have said across the agencies. And please know that we are always present and always available to work with you, our council members, to achieve these common goals. We welcome the opportunity to assist you in any way. Thank you. Councilmember Lanceman has a question. Time starts now. Thank you. Um, um, you've talked about the, the, the changes that you need to see from OCA, from, from the Office of Court Administration. Um, others have mentioned them. Um, we're gonna have a conversation after this hearing where we can really drill down on that and, and, and we can you know, try to get um, you know, faster movement on that. Although I, I don't think you're, you're disagreeing that you know, OCA is trying to deal with a difficult situation you know, as best as, as, as they can. Um, other than, than the mechanics of the operation of the courts now, which, which kinds of hearings and petitions can, and motions can be heard, what, 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 uh, how do clerks do things remotely, all of that they're trying to work on. Um, and we're gonna to try to move that along uh, uh, for you and, and with you. Are there, are there resource issues um, that, that you anticipate having? I don't wanna turn this into a budget hearing, but um, how much of ensuring that the legal needs of domestic violence victims are taken care of have to do with the mechanics and operations of the courts and how much has to do with the resources that will be available to you? So within legal aid, we are up and running. We have the capacity to do the virtual um, court appearances, to meet with our clients over the internet or to do it by text and by um, telephone. We don't have that need, but we do have a need that this, these resources be available for the courts. Even before the, the virus um, crisis began, video accessing in the court system was limited. And I speak to family court where the video machine has to move from one um, courtroom to the other. If we can all um, communicate virtually, conduct these hearings virtually, then we need the resources available for the courts to be able to do that also. And the personnel and the, the um, staff that would be available in order to facilitate those resources. In the same way, we're going to need more attorneys available to represent people because we're all anticipating that once people get out, we have filings just waiting. We have so many people that we've talked to that we've said, we can't help you now, but we got to get this filed as soon as it's open to file. Those logistics, um, I can't even imagine how the court is going to negotiate the number of filings that start coming in, but we need the resources. So, so in terms of resources, it, 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 it's... It sounds like it's really all a function of the backlog that is accruing as opposed to legal services of a different kind and a different type as a result of the effect that the coronavirus situation is, is having on, on, on people and families. Yes, I, I would say yes. I, I don't think we're going to get, at least in the family and domestic abuse sector, different types of needs. Um, abusers will be abusers. This is one new and different opportunity to find a way to coercively control their spouses. If they can do it by claiming it's a uh, a public health need, I won't bring the child back. If they can do it by claiming you're a hospital worker, you're risking my child. The, they will use whatever mechanism and we do have the responses in place and we do have the experts and the professionals in place to, to address it. But we are gonna have um, a volume. There, there's no way that post crisis, we're not gonna see what is unearthed when people are able to come out and get help safely. Um, based on the advice that we've been giving people, they know that they're not in a position now to 
take it up in the court system. Divorce is the last thing you do after you feed yourself and you have shelter and you have safety and you have resources, then you go and you do the, the legal filings um, that go with it. So it's our frontline people who really are, are going to have to, to get in there and get those people out of their difficult situations. Thank you. Thank you. We have no other council member questions, so we will move to the next witness. Our next witness is Julie Taylor from Center for Court Innovation. Time starts now. Good afternoon. Thank you to the council for holding this important hearing. My name is Julie Taylor. I'm the Director of Community Impact and Youth Initiatives at the Center for Court Innovation. The center has seen the impact of COVID and the stay-at-home order through our program serving survivors referred through law enforcement, our work with individuals accused of causing harm, and our community-based programs. In addition to our work in New York City, the center works with over 60 jurisdictions across the country on improving their responses to intimate partner violence. Since the COVID crisis, the center has been hosting weekly calls for domestic violence attorneys, advocates, battered intervention programs, and prosecutors to share experience and strategize responses. The center has a longstanding commitment to working within the criminal justice system with individuals who are accused of causing harm to address those harms and prevent reoffending. Our supervised release program provides a community supervision alternative to pretrial detention and programming specific to IPB. Our victim services program in Red Hook, Red Hook Cares, provides advocacy, counseling, and case management to individuals who have experienced or witnessed crime and violence. In the wake of COVID-19, CARES immediately pivoted to providing all services remotely and virtually. CARES continues to receive referrals from the district attorney and to provide crisis counseling, safety planning, and advocacy virtually. The center also uses restorative justice circles to address intimate partner violence through CARES and separately with young people in schools. We continue to see that young people and the community want access to these kinds of approaches to reduce violence during the COVID uh, ep epidemic. Uh, the center also operates the RISE project, which prevents and responds to IPV in neighborhoods most impacted by community violence. RISE is a part of the city's crisis management system and works in partnership with anti-gun violence program sites across the city using community-based restorative and public health, approach, public health approaches to build our community's abilities to prevent and respond to IPV, connect survivors to resources, and voluntarily engage individuals causing harm. RISE provides street outreach, public education, training, community workshops and circles, and gender-based programming. RISE serves uh, communities of color where justice system responses may not seem like a safe option due to uh, past experiences and harm systems may have caused in the community or fears around escalation. Survivors need services they are comfortable with and that don't compound other issues such as employment or economic insecurity, especially during this time. It is often our credible messengers and community providers, the people who are in our neighborhoods day in and day out, that those experiencing harm feel safe reaching out to first. This is true now more than ever. With COVID, community members are more physically isolated and at the same time, the trusted community providers and credible messengers may be less physically present, which may mean there are fewer opportunities for those who need help to reach out. We're all doing our best with virtual services, but we know many are not able to access these services virtually um, as many have, have spoken to already due to safety concerns and uh, space. We also need community responses to people causing harm and violence. We can't wait until they are arrested. A system response isn't enough, especially now as many people um, may be less likely to call on law enforcement. We need to provide additional tools to reduce violence levels. Everyone who abuses does not interact with the criminal justice system. Um, programs that focus on long-term engagement in neighborhoods and communities build trust and increase access to resources and can provide their continued reinforcement tools and resources that those who have caused harm need to change their behaviors and maintain that change over time. Our research has confirmed that survivors from communities of color, LGBTQ communities in particular seek interventions that will also address the harm in the context of the social, economic, and cultural realities they experience. Participants from communities of color stress the need for in interventions outside the criminal legal system that would not jeopardize their partners or families with deportation or incarceration. As one survivor said, I need support that did not demonize undocumented men of color. Thank you to the council for holding this critical hearing and providing us with an opportunity to share our work. We look forward to our continued partnership to promote safe and healthy communities. We do not have any council member questions. Thank you for your testimony. We will move to the next witness. Daniel Fields from URI. 
Please wait for the sergeant to announce that you may begin before delivering your testimony. You are the next witness. You may begin, Daniel. Good afternoon, Speaker Johnson, Councilmember Rosenthal and Richards and other members. Uh, my name is Nathaniel Fields and I have the pleasure of being the CEO for Urban Resource Institute, URI, as well as the chair for over a decade of the New York City Coalition of Residential Domestic Violence. The latter, the latter, excuse me, represents all licensed domestic violence shelter programs in New York City. I am so thankful for the opportunity to come before you and share some important lessons and takeaways from our frontline work at URI during the COVID-19 outbreak. That being said, I do wanna pause for just a moment and thank all of you, elected officials, government agencies, providers and survivors, as New York City has the most comprehensive approach to domestic and gender-based violence. I also want to acknowledge the work of the nonprofit sector. We haven't talked about this enough. During this crisis, um, the nonprofit sector, particularly the women and men at URI, they've made tremendous sacrifices, leaving their home each day uh, to take care of vulnerable New Yorkers, uh, more specifically victims of domestic violence. And again, I really appreciate each and every one of them in the work that they're doing. A little more about URI. For over 40 years, we've been, been providing that client-centered trauma-informed services to victims of domestic violence and gender-based violence, as well as shelter services for homeless uh, with a focus on communities of color. That being said, URI is organized to end domestic and gender-based violence. And to this end, we have over 1,200 beds or close to, I should say, 1,200 beds for victims of domestic violence at any given day in New York City. And that allows us to be the largest domestic violence shelter provider in New York City, as well as in the country. And I'm gonna talk about our plans to increase capacity based on what's happening with COVID-19. We also offer additional services because we do know we need a comprehensive approach. You've heard from my colleagues that uh, talked about uh, many survivors don't reach out to the uh, criminal justice system. So we do need a comprehensive approach and that's what we've done in New York City and that's what we've done at URI. So we offer additional services such as economic empowerment programs for survivors and a full suite of dating violence prevention and community education programs. In junior high schools and in high schools, we reach nearly 40,000 people each year. Uh, we also work with abusive partners. If we're gonna end domestic violence, we know we're working with uh, abusive partners, working with them around accountability and promising and evidence-based practices. We do this work in partnership with Danny in Westchester County and in New York City. Let's talk quickly about New York City and our response. You know, as we began to shelter in place, uh, we partnered with state uh, representatives to include DOH to better understand the virus and the necessary implications for the populations we serve. This resulted in an engagement of proactive uh, review of our disaster emergency program uh, initiatives. We knew the current uh, policies weren't going to work. So this was unprecedented and we moved quickly. In crisis, we wanna be right, but we need to move also quickly. So we had to enhance our protocols. We developed systems of tracking, uh, health tracking and processes for daily check-in. We had to take care uh -huh. of those concrete things, such as pantries, uh, uh, stocking pantries with food and over-the-counter medication. We had to clean uh, rigorously because uh, the survivors were coming into shelter. We had to get those PPEs. We also had to work with our staff members. You know, our staff members, like our clients, they were experiencing a heightened sense of anxiety and loss. We've lost staff members due to COVID-19 and we had to expand our EAP services. So I wanna just talk about a way forward because uh, as you've heard uh, from my colleagues that we have to think about moving forward. And some of the things we did, did at your Nathaniel? eyes. Nathaniel? Yes. Nathaniel, yes. if I could just, um, unfortunately we, we still have 14 more witnesses. It's five o'clock and you're getting to the meat of what I really wanna hear yep. you talk about, which is what's different under COVID, what do we need to do going forward? I'm gonna ask you to try to summarize that in about a minute. And then for the people who are waiting to testify, if you could just look through your testimony real quick and know that we really will put a hard stop on three minutes going forward. And if you could think about answering the most important question at this time, which is what's different under COVID and what resources or, or what more could the city be doing to help you do your job better so we can meet the needs of survivors? Um, so Nathaniel, I'll just ask you to wrap that up and then we'll move on. And I appreciate that. You know, when I think about the good work that's been done, I do think we can do some a few things. 
we need to continue to communicate. Uh, when individuals are in crises, they don't hear often the messages and availability of services. So we have to continue to look at uh, how we communicate. I think the majority leader Cumbo said, tell me about uh, uh, safe housing. And so I think we need to talk about shelter, take away some of the myths and misconceptions and say that we're doing a lot to keep uh, uh, survivors safe in shelter. I think our technology and systems have to change. Listen, I sit on a national domestic violence hotline advisory council. They have over 400,000 contacts. I didn't say calls, I said contacts. And that means calls, chats, and texts. Last year, their, their texts and chats exceeded their phone calls. So we know uh, we need to improve our systems and we need to do it as quickly as possible. Because survivors, particularly now in the time of COVID, uh, when they may be around an abusive partner, need to find other ways to communicate. So we definitely have to do that. And this is a time not to reduce funding. We need to get ready. I think what we've learned from a federal and a, a local level, we have to be ready. So part of what we're doing, we're getting ready to increase our DV shelter capacity. We have two shelters opening in the first quarter. We hope to expedite that process working with HRA and OTDA as part of the city's plan uh, in terms of uh, uh, ensuring that there's services for victims of domestic violence. Thank you great. all Thank for you. all the great work and that's just been to happening. Thank you so much. And just real quickly, Nathaniel, are the current shelters that URI runs, what percentage capacity are you at? We have about uh, anywhere from 88 to 95% capacity, depending on the location. Across the system, I think we have about 8 to 12% availability. I'm not sure if you heard I'm my response. Out of space okay. yet. Yeah. Okay. No, no, we don't Thank think that's the case. And we're actually built bringing on new shelters during the first quarter. Uh, as people move out into right. the public, I think we'll be ready as a city. Right. Thank you very much. If going forward, people could try to limit their remarks to three minutes, I'd appreciate that. I'll turn that back to you, uh, General Counsel McKinney. Thank you, Chair Rosenthal. We'll move to our next witness now, Alyssa Creel, or Keel, excuse me, from New Destiny Housing. When the sergeant says begin, please start your testimony. Thank you. You may begin this. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today regarding the effects of COVID-19 pandemic on domestic violence in New York City. My name is Alyssa Kyle, and I'm the director of Housing Link at New Destiny Housing Corporation, a 26-year-old nonprofit committed to ending the cycle of domestic violence and homelessness by connecting families to safe, permanent housing and services. And with Chair Rosenthal's comments about really boiling it down, that's what I'm going. We, our, our main concerns right now with um, our clients and for survivors as a whole in New York City is that their options prior to COVID, which included shelter and still does include shelter, um, and also included staying with friends and family temporarily if they were in danger in their home, um, those are now limited and less safe going to stay with friends or family um, now could put everyone at risk for, for, for the virus. Um, and while shelter beds are still available, as um, Mr. Fields just mentioned, they're still available. Um, they are historically difficult to access for families, um, single folks and larger families. So they're not always an option for everyone. And our bigger concern is what happens after shelter and why is shelter the only option right now? So our bigger concern is permanent housing, both right now, getting people into safe housing during COVID, but also um, having that available to people after this pandemic has ended. So there are two programs right now um, that, that currently exist that we believe could be expanded. The Homeless Set-Aside Program and Augmented City Fence are two innovative programs that connect certain New Yorkers experiencing homelessness with affordable housing units around the city. However, only those individuals in the DHS homeless shelter system are granted access to these programs. All other shelter systems, including the HRA domestic violence shelter system, are excluded. And again, those programs are the homeless aside placement unit, which is managed by HPD and DHS, and puts people into units that are predetermined during the development process of a building to go to homeless New Yorkers and augmented city fence, which is very new and allows people in shelter only in DHS shelter to 
move into higher income affordable housing units and have their city FEPS voucher payments increased. And as affordable housing units remain some of the few apartments still consistently leasing new units in these times, it is more important than ever that the domestic violence shelter system receive equal treatment under city housing program. While many people have never experienced the housing and financial instability caused by COVID-19, low-income survivors of domestic violence face these challenges every day. The pandemic has only amplified their challenges and decreased their options. Now is the time to act to ensure that survivors are not forced to shelter in place with the person who's harming them and expand options for them to find long-term housing even after the pandemic has ended. Thank you for this opportunity and I welcome any questions you have. We do not have any council member questions at this time. So we will move to the next witness. Before we call the next witness, these are the uh, witnesses that will come after the next person. Raquel Singh, Quadria Coles, Nakama Boxed, and Morgan Siegel. So the next witness is Sylvia Morse. You may begin when the Sergeant in Arms tells you the clock has begun. You may begin. Is Sylvia Morris from SCO available? Okay, the next witness, we'll move to the next witness, which is Raquel Singh. Raquel, you can go ahead. Can you hear me? We can, is somebody speaking? Hi, can you hear me? Oh, yeah, yes. Oh, okay, great, thank you. Um, good afternoon. I'd like to take this time to thank Chair Rosenthal and Chair Richards for creating this space for survivors of domestic violence to share their voice today. My name is Raquel Singh. I am the executive director of the Voices of Women. VOW is made up of community organizers who are survivors of domestic violence and child witnesses of domestic violence. We work to reform and revolutionize domestic violence policy, its implementation, and the services survivors turn to for safety, justice, and assistance. We continue with our mission to organize intensely to protect survivors and their children. For survivors of domestic violence and their children, COVID-19 has not only rattled their existing methods of surviving an abusive relationship, it has destroyed them in many ways. The administration's current response to survivors is not enough, and they have not fully evolved to meet survivors' needs. We still don't know what happens when a survivor needs support or when a survivor used their work, errands, and general outside time as a refuge for their abuser, as a refuge from their abusers. As you know, social distancing is a form of isolation, and isolation is a primary tactic of abusers. Survivors are trapped with their abusers and nowhere else to go. Imagine having to live like this, and now think about it as a parent attempting to homeschool your child. We have deepening concerns about ACS interaction with survivors where the entry point is educational neglect. City agencies, particularly ACS and DOE, are using the same guidelines as they did pre-COVID-19 to engage survivors of domestic violence. The systems must increase their understanding of domestic violence, change how they do their work, or they will re-victimize survivors. There also needs to be better guidance from the administration to these agencies on how to engage survivors in need. We recognize that calls to the domestic violence hotlines may go up and down. What you are seeing is the nature of a domestic violence relationship in real time. When calls are down, it does not mean that violence in some form is not present. It could actually indicate a rise in incidence of domestic violence in conjunction with a seriously concerning inability on the part of the survivor to reach out for help due to the stay at home order. We recommend that these DV response systems become readily available to chat, text, and develop other touch points for survivors to reach out for help. 
if they do not, survivors will remain in grave danger. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. We do not have any council member questions and we'll move to the next witness. Kodira Coles. Hi. Good afternoon, Chair Rosenthal, Chair Richards, and members and staff of the City Council. My name is Cordera Coles, and I am the Policy Manager at Girls for Gender Equity. GGE is an intergenerational organization based in Brooklyn, committed to all around development of girls and young women. GGE challenges structural forces, including sexism, racism, gender-based violence, transphobia, hom homophobia, and economic inequity. We do this work through direct services, advocacy, and culture change. GGE has been a leader in a conversation around gender-based violence, including sexual harassment and abuse for close to two decades. We are offering testimony today because we want to raise awareness about the ways gender-based violence has impacted young people of color during COVID. During this pandemic, GGE has continued to center the health and well-being of our young people. Our program has been conducting ongoing safety assessment wellness checks and building safety plans with our young people, especially those young people who have history of trauma. Our girls, our Sisters in Stream program, which supports survivors of child sexual abuse, sexual violence, and gender-based violence has built curriculum on processing grief as survivors, self-care while sheltering in place, safe and intimate partner relationships during COVID, and how to stay social while social distancing. Demands around social shift to remote learning introduce new kinds of conflict. In one situation, we learned early on of a series of acts on Facebook and social media in which harmful photos were released to young people across New York City. Our young people were heavily impacted by this moment. They shared with their facilitators that this disruptive and triggering event had scarred them and made them concerned about this new moment where interactions are forced online and girls' bodies are easily exposed. GGE staff immediately responded. We held space, holding restorative circles and offering tools for young people to engage in self-care and address concerns. Additionally, our team has shifted the curriculum and built in a module to educate participants about cyber safety and how gender-based violence appears in the digital realm. We continue to offer support about how to navigate boundaries on in online spaces, GGE filled critical gaps in services in the case while, in this case, while young people's schools were ill-prepared or unequipped to respond to a trauma-informed, healing-centered way. Since March, our programs have adjusted to convene, educate, support, and organize young people virtually. We offer counseling services for all young people by staff, by our staff social workers. In these one-on-one -on -one sessions, staff, staff are addressing the impact of grief and isolation on sleep in our emotional states. We have linked young people to meditation and wellness apps, the tele and teletherapy supports, and 24-hour hotlines. Additionally, our social workers have provided consultation on how to navigate parental and sibling relationships, especially when there is history of conflict, including a history of emotional abuse. Wow of a young person's gender expression, ex sexuality, enforcement of unfair gender roles with the family system um, as young girls are expected to be household care caregivers instead of completing their schoolwork. GGE services have always been essential for New York City's most vulnerable youth and now COVID-19 is exposing what our young people have always known that GGE fills the critical gap and service, critical service gaps that the most vulnerable youth experience due to systemic failure. We must ensure that the Young Women's Initiative and other city council efforts which meet the needs of youth survivors are preserved and protected. They remain essential during these difficult times. Thank you. We do not have any council member questions, so we'll move to the next witness. The next witness is Nakama Box from the Met Council. You may begin when Sergeant gives notice. You may begin. Ms. Box, I think you're on mute. Oh. Oh, we just couldn't hear your volume.
No, we don't hear you. Please unmute yourself. It looks like she may be having some difficulties with her audio. Uh, maybe we should go to the next witness, please. Okay, uh, Ms. Box from the Met Council, we can't hear you, so we'll go to the next witness. Um, please let us know if you need help. Um, Morgan Siegel? Go ahead. Okay. Hi. Yes, I'm here. Please begin with, with the sergeant's notice. Go ahead, you may begin. Good afternoon, Chair and Council Members. My name is Morgan Siegel and I am the Assistant Director for Case Coordination at Northern Manhattan Improvement Corporation. On behalf of NIMIC, we would like to thank you for inviting us to provide testimony. NIMIC has served survivors of domestic violence since 1998 through its community-based domestic violence project. We serve primarily immigrant survivors of Latin America who live below the poverty line, speak limited to no English and have deep fears due to immigration status. DVP at NIMIC is comprised of a team of bilingual and bicultural counselors, attorneys, and advocates who provide holistic support and expertise. All services are trauma-informed, no cost, confidential, and long-term. DVP at NIMIC has been responsive and adapted services to continue to provide access to support for survivors via platforms such as WhatsApp, text, email, and other safe forums. The team has been able to provide virtual support groups in Spanish, which foster community and allow for information sharing and connection during a time of physical distancing. Staff provide virtual trauma-focused therapy via telephone and video, work closely with community partners to conduct outreach and provide crisis intervention. Since survivor safety and dependence is directly related and linked to having access to essential basic needs, DVP at NIMIC continues to address economic empowerment, linking survivors to benefits, emergency grants, food pantries, and other resources. Survivors of domestic violence are vulnerable to experiencing additional life-threatening risks related to coronavirus. Isolation, increased risk for abuse, and susceptibility to contracting COVID are impacting survivors increasingly as time goes by. Not only are immigrant survivors coping with ongoing and past trauma often triggered by current, the current pandemic, but they are faced with a multitude of systemic and contextual barriers that place them in the eye of the storm within the epicenter of the pandemic. Social distancing practices can often keep survivors in a home that is unsafe and further perpetuate a batterer's ability to isolate and control victims. I would like to share with you a story of one of our clients who we will call Maria. Um, this name and other identifying information has been changed for privacy. Maria is an undocumented immigrant with her four children living in the Bronx, a short walk over the bridge to Washington Heights. A victim of strangulation, verbal abuse, and coercive control, she had decided this past winter to separate from her abusive partner after many years of abuse. She found new employment and felt emotionally stronger to cope with being a single parent. Shortly after New York on pause quarantine began, her abusive partner returned to the home after he lost his job. Their children insisted that he be allowed to return temporarily and Maria felt a sense of compassion and obligation. They met in Colombia as teenagers and as the father of her children, she felt compelled to let him return during this time. Life during quarantine has been tense, painful and frightening for Maria. Her abuser forced her to quit her job out of jealousy, also making her feel guilty for potentially placing the family at risk. He controls all of the finances and has begun to drink heavily. He is extremely jealous and berates her for being on her telephone, accusing her of speaking to other men. As a father, he constantly undermines her authority and disparages her in front of her children. Maria has decided against entering shelter, fearing that her children's health and removing them from the only home they have known. Maria and her counselor at DVP at NIMIC have arranged for code words and safe times to call to provide safety planning, counseling, and support. Maria has reached out in crisis during escalating arguments and her counselor stayed on the phone as she waited for the police to arrive. She is working with our family law attorneys. Yeah. To... Oh, sorry. Okay. Sorry, I know I went over time. Um, I'll just finish about Maria. Um, she's working with our family law attorney to discuss seeking an order of protection um, and other legal rights. She's been assessed for, uh, by our immigration attorney to explore a U visa petition. Um, we're also addressing economic concerns by linking her to public benefits that might support her during this time. 
Um, she is learning how to mitigate the risk, coping with feelings and safely plan for, um, for a new beginning. Once again, um, thank you for the opportunity to submit testimony and wish you and your families uh, much health and safety. Thank you for your testimony. We do not have any council member questions at this time. We're going to call Ms. Box from the Met Council again. Go ahead. Ms. Box, we can see you speaking, but we can't hear you. Just a reminder, when you registered, you had an opportunity to upload testimony. You can also email it to testimony at council.nyc.gov and it will be added to the record, your full testimony. Um, we're still having technical difficulties and can't hear you, Ms. Box. You're on mute. If we could unmute you. Unfortunately, Ms. Box, we still can't hear you. I'm going to move to the next witness. The next witness, excuse me, the next witness is Enrique Jarvis. Hi, I am here, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Hi, hi everyone. Uh, good afternoon, Council Member Drosdal and also Craig Johnson. Thank you for your time and thank you for letting me speak today. I will try to be as much concise as possible. I'm receiving some calls from clients. I am the Legal Victim Assistance Program Director at HANAC. I work in the program about seven years already. I do the similar work that you do. I just want to let you know what we are doing to navigate um, the pandemic. Um, we used to provide forums about human trafficking and domestic violence with attorney. So in that way, we can encourage and educate the community about what is available in New York City. Unfortunately, due to the funding, uh, is always a, a problem with the funding. Um, we had to switch or make changes with the work scope. So last January, um, I was invited uh, to the radio for an interview. Um, it was good. Actually, I had a chance to provide services in the radio on Saturdays, so we decided to do philanthropic work on Saturdays in the Bronx to provide information about uh, divorce or their potations, cost of the rise, visitations, and also domestic violence resources. Uh, we used to love it, go every Saturday to the Bronx to provide this information, waking up five o'clock like an entertainment for us. In that way, we can ed educate the community about it. Unfortunately, the COVID-19 came up and we cannot do that anymore. So what we did, I am going to switch my camera if that is possible. Uh, in three hours of work, uh, we recycled material that we had in the office. We created the HANA community radio that we are providing podcasts and also we are educating the community online. So we are inviting guests from different organizations, Safe Horizon, Middle of New York, psychologists, attorneys, to provide the available services for COVID-19 survivors and also domestic violence survivors. So uh, pretty much that's what I do to outreach and also educate uh, victims and domestic violence uh, survivors. I, I think this is possible. I am not an expert, I am not an engineer. Actually, my field is management and also provide uh, services, social services. But I learned this on, on YouTube. I had to learn it on YouTube. I had to put it in place so we educate the community. Uh, we are our outreach right now is 2000 followers per radio. Um, and we are doing the same thing on Facebook. We are recording this in uh, the platform and updating to Spotify, Pandora, and, and different things. So the followers can listen that later on. Uh, we put uh -huh. information about the social services and different things. So I am open for, for questions if you want to. We do not have any council member questions. We'll hold for one moment. 
So we try to address a technical difficulty. Yeah, it's fine. You can wait. So while you do that, um, yeah, I think this can be part of services outreach. And also in the beginning of today, we were speaking about tech need in the field. So I think this can be done. Actually, we can invite other organizations, council members to share resources to this. It's free, it's online. Um, we created even a player that the listeners can listen. We send this in WhatsApp as well. And actually, we are working with domestic violence survivors, trying to help them and empowering them to learn this technology field. So in case in the future, they try to learn or find jobs about it, then they learn about how to do this. So this is an alternative that we are doing so far. Thank um, you very much for your testimony. No we do not have any council member questions. If there is anyone we missed uh, inadvertently who has signed up to testify and you have not been called, please use the, ra the raise hand function at this point in the participants panel. And we will call on you in the order that hands have been raised. So this is the end of our list of witnesses who are present. If we have inadvertently missed you, please raise your hand through Zoom, the raise hand function. Okay, we are going to try to return a missed box. Council member Rosenthal, Chair Rosenthal, did you have a question? Oh, you're on, you're on mute, council member, Chair Rosenthal. Okay, just real quick um, to Miss Box, did you, one thing that can often help is if you leave uh, the Zoom and then you log back in. I don't know if you already did that. I just really want to, I'm looking forward to hearing your testimony. Um, but that was all I was going to say. Let's, we'll see if this works. We'll just give it one moment. Several staff members are also working with her. So we'll try to work out the technical difficulty um, before we close the witness portion of the hearing. Again, if there is anyone that we inadvertently left off and who wished to testify, who's on the list and has not been called, please use the raise hand function in Zoom. Raise your hand now and we will call on you in the order that you raised your hands. We're going to wait 30 seconds. We think that this is being addressed. Please stand by. Ms. Boxed. I think you're unmuted. No? Ms. Box, can you hear us? Can you start your testimony? Yeah. No. <laughs> we're going to we're going to close this. So, right. Richard and uh, Chairs Rosenthal and Richards, um, Chair Rosenthal, we'll move back to you. This concludes the witness portion of the hearing. Thank you so much to committee counsel Brenda McKinney. You handled that beautifully. I think it was 
four hours, uh, four and a half hours of testimony. Thank you for pulling through so smoothly. Uh, you really did a great job. I appreciate that. Um, Council Member Richards, would you like to make a closing statement? I have a very short one, but would you, I defer to you. Sure, uh, and I wanna thank you, Council Member Rosenthal for your leadership on this issue to Speaker Johnson. Uh, to my uh, counsel, Daniel Adis, uh, uh, who uh, oversees the, uh, the Public Safety Committee, to Matthew Thompson, to Nevin Singh, and to my legislative director, uh, Tiffany Easton, I just want to say thank you. There's a lot more work to be done around this. We want uh, DV victims to know that uh, they should report. Uh, if you feel silenced, if you feel scared at this moment, um, we are here for you. You should know that you can contact our offices, that you should call 911, uh, and that we are here to work directly with you to ensure you're getting the services that you need. So don't be afraid. Um, we are here for you. You have people who have your back 1,000%, and this is why we had this hearing today, and we look forward to following up with the NYPD uh, specifically on a lot of the things discussed today. I want to thank uh, Councilmember Rosenthal and the Women's and Gender Equity Committee for their leadership here and look forward to our continued partnership. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chair Richards. It's always a pleasure um, sharing a hearing with you. Uh, you're just have been extraordinary in making sure that oversight on the NYPD is um, constant and I really appreciate your work. I want to thank all the advocates we've we've spoken with and worked with uh, over 50 advocates over the last few weeks in preparation for this hearing. But we really want to thank you for the good work that you are doing. Um, you know, Councilmember Richards, thank you for reminding people if you need help now, all of the city's hotlines and the nonprofit hotlines they are up and running. The shelters are available to you. Um, medical treatment is available to you. Um, the city's hotline, the, the city-wide hotline, 24-hour hotline is 1-800-621-HOPE, um, H-O-P-E. Um, and then they can refer you to uh, other hotlines and other services. Um, particularly in, in a language that um, is not in English. VIP is in Spanish. Um, there are many hotlines out there in, in multiple languages. Um, and I, I really want to, of course, thank all the city council staff for your hard work in pulling this together. This was a terrific um, hearing. The two pieces of information that, that I find very concerning that I want to reiterate is um, number one, there's a real disconnect between um, the number, the, the real drop in the number of complaints, DV complaints issued, uh, reports taken, whether they be on rape, uh, felony, or misdemeanor. Um, the, all DV reports, complaints are down in a, to a meaningful extent and, and around are down as well. And I'm looking forward to hearing from the PD as they look into the looking at the body cam or, or whatever other metrics they're using to assure themselves that that that, that something is not amiss here. Um, and to the administration, you know, I was really disappointed to hear that the COVID um, text line 652652, they have only put out four DV related texts uh, in the seven weeks that uh, we've been in this pandemic. Um, the first one came, it took until April 7th. Um, we heard from provider after provider today about the need for more, more robust and culturally competent messaging. I think the city needs to step up its game. There's no time like the present to do that. And lastly, I don't hear from the administration about um, a thoughtful uh, plan with meaningful resources behind it for when the pause is lifted 
and, and we see people coming out really needing uh, help, counseling, legal services, shelter, whatever it may be, um, we want to let survivors know those services will be available to them, um, but we don't want to see the city scrambling to make sure they're available. That type of preparation can be happening right now. Um, so we look forward to hearing a lot more um, from the administration on this. Lastly, I'll say that the council, due to, to Speaker Johnson's very good leadership, um, council members now have social media tools. We'll be getting those out all next week going forward um, to, to try to get the word out to all of our constituents that, um, that resources are absolutely available to DV survivors. Um, I hope everyone is staying safe and, and staying well and getting the help that they need. They know they can come forward. And with that, I'm calling this hearing to a close. Thank you.